in their semi-final, something happened. I was like, yes, we're beating them, we're beating them. And they came off the water and it turned out that I think the bow man had said something that offended the three man and the three man just stopped rowing. 200 meters before the finish line, just threw his handles away and started screaming at the bow man. And they came in and had a huge argument and then the next day put it to bed and won the race. But it's just like a different side of the sport that you don't see. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Stroke Counts. In today's episode, we're pleased to host the head coach of Saudi Arabia and former GB rowing team member, Mr. Mafi Tarrant. Please welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on, man. It's, uh, it's been good to, obviously, you are not in the country that often uh, at oh. the moment. So um, I'm, I'm happy we've managed to squeeze this one in. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be fun to talk about rowing. Again, obviously, we shared a little bit of our rowing career um and then especially what you've gone on to do afterwards i think it's going to be really interesting mm -hmm. i think a lot of other people find it interesting but certainly i will as well um <laughs> yeah yeah nah, <laughs> definitely definitely uh yeah so uh we normally sort of get started with sort of how how you got into rome but first i'll just give it a little rundown on uh on your achievements i'm sure there's more than, than what i've got here but just um to get things going so um Double double junior worlds, uh, 07, 08, silver in 08, and then four times under 23 world champion um, world championships. So 9, 10, oh, 11, and 12. 10th, <laughs> third, third, and then gold on your fourth attempt uh, in the pair. Uh, and then straight into senior worlds. There's another one where I think like going from under 23s to seniors is like difficult to do in one year but like obviously we're interviewing the right athletes because uh, quite a few of you have done it you just get lucky sometimes with that olympic crossover yeah 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 13 yeah so 13 14 15 seniors so 15 13 then gold in 14 gold in 15 double senior world champion um rio 2016 spare pair winner of the spares pairs race um back into worlds again senior worlds 2017 third third place 2018 third place 2019 third place Obviously, 2020 didn't happen, but then 2021 Tokyo spare pair again, another win, undefeated spare pair. Yep. Um, and then on to the, um, beyond that, obviously, you did a little bit um, uh, for your own sort of um, coaching program and then on to Saudi and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, fantastic, again, just looking down the list, you know, to hit us uh, world championships every year from 07 to, to 21 with no you know no breaks no none miss is is awesome um i'm sure we'll get into a little bit about what it takes to to stay on top that long but i think just i mean hopefully even you when you see it laid out like that you sort of look yeah back and be like well yeah you do think about it sometimes you sort of oh how long is about 15 years worth some people think that's a bit like loserish like do you not get a life <laughs> yeah <laughs> but literally like like you say if your goal is the olympics you put everything on the line to try and achieve it yeah and for me, that's what my summer holidays were all about. Signing up for back then when the Europeans was after all the world championships. Yeah, yeah. So you sort of finish a junior world's on the 23s, go do Europeans in your summer break and then back off to uni again. Yeah, yeah. 2012, that was a hell of a season, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, because that was super, it was like late September, nearly October. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And that's when I said you, sometimes you just get lucky because you had the London Olympics and then everyone was leaving and there was just enough room for all of us lot to come in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was good. That was, yeah, that was kind of a good way. Although we, you know, like being part of that European group was, I think we kind of been earmarked for, for that slot. But then you yeah. never really know how many people are going to leave. Well, that's the thing. You don't know. Like, they, in they, they don't even know. They don't even know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I remember being on a senior camp in like 2011. I was like in the physio room and Pete Reed was in there. He's like, yeah, no, def def definitely. This is my last one. And I'd heard some other people. So I think because they took us up as under 23. That's Nevada. Yeah, like a yeah. Sierra Nevada one. They took us under 23s. And I was like, oh, I've, I've heard a lot of people are, are quitting after London. Like, this is going to be great. And it's like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> still going. Still <laughs> going. Not a lot of spaces left. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. So, like, interesting thing to get in is like how, how you found rowing, how you got into it in the first place, how it became the obsession. How it became the obsession. So, in my family, we have a sort of a, a background in rugby. Yeah. And so me and my two brothers, we all started off playing rugby. Um, we played it for, I think we started at Old Redonians, then we went to London Irish for a bit. We played it at school. 
I was the first one to step back from that, tried a bit of swimming, bit of tennis, bit of football. Didn't really find my niche in any of those. And then um, we had some family friends who ran out of Pangborn on their summer holidays, ran out of Weber's Rowing Club. And they just saw that I was tall and I was bigger than most kids my age. They told me to come down, give it a go. I went down, gave it a go, absolutely hated it. <laughs> At the time, I had a paper round. And um, especially on the weekends, I sort of come back from my paper round, jump straight into bed and pretend I was so tired from my one hour paper round that I couldn't, I couldn't go and train. So I'd always miss that, that slot from leaving and making training on time. But it was my older brother, Alex, that kept telling me, come on, come down, make some friends, get into it. And slowly but surely, I, I, that's what I did. I made lots of really close friends who I'm still really close with to this day. Um, I naturally fell into the sport. I sort of found my niche being bigger than everyone else my age at sort of 14, 15. Yeah. It made ergos a lot easier for me. And, you know, I still had to work hard on the water, but I found something that I think I was naturally quite good at. And then from that point onwards, I just wanted to see how far I could pursue it. That's it, really. Like you, there's a couple of people who have sort of said that from the start, they really hated it, yeah. but they did it because they hated it less than something else. But I think in general, for most people, it's like, you've got to have that passion for it. Like that's half of it. Yeah. Um, I think in, to in, uh, the passion for it and then also like a coach who you got on with or felt supported by like. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's huge. And especially at Weybridge. I mean, we didn't necessarily have a coach. It was very much family run. Okay. And I know my first coach when I was there was um, my good friend, Matt, his dad, came in and he he basically took over the show with some of the other dads and they all sort of tried looking after as much as they could and then they um paid for um a guy called paul wilcox yeah who now coaches st george's um he came in as our first ever paid coach saw me and my older brother saw us on the ergo and thought why aren't you doing gb trials and so them paying a coach to come down and look after the junior squad identified me and my brother unfortunately my brother's birthday's in december and he just fell on that too old yeah. scale of like maybe three days you're no longer a junior but for me i was plenty young enough so he filled in the forms he sweet talked uh thrust to let me come down and take part of trials uh and then pushed me on to walton where i got trained by nick de carter and i sort of found my groove there and i think you know like you say it, from that age it's, it's the coaches that sort of decide your career path i guess yeah so that's pretty so you it wasn't at school you weren't wearing at school this was like completely outside of school which yeah which was quite rare to like yeah so i was i was always state school and at school i was i was dyslexic and i think when i first went to school i had a stutter so i had lots of speech therapy to sort of get rid of the stutters at school dyslexic hated sitting exams always sucked at that you know hate sitting down having to write and spell literature's completely out the window um, but I, I found my calling when I went to college at Brooklyn's College in Weybridge and it was more of an engineering degree so it was more hands-on design building that sort of stuff um, and sort of that sort of guided me through the educational side of things but yeah you know. I was also super dyslexic and hated everything to do with school and yeah. sport was that's quite good I'm sure I've said before but like in my school um, detentions were Wednesday afternoons and Saturday mornings mm -hmm. and rowing is Wednesday afternoon, Saturday morning. So it's just, <laughs> it's like, all right, if I want to row, I just have to not be naughty, get my homework in time, just do it, do it, so I can go rowing. Yeah. Well, so. I, I, I didn't have that problem because my school didn't row at all. So I literally had to like get get away from school, get on an hour's bus, go to my rowing club. I was like the only kid from my, my school that, that was rowing at all. But that was good because because no one else was doing it, I could get away with doing quite a lot of like, missing quite a lot of lessons or not turning up to homework and oh i had this event at the weekend and no one go, no one's gonna check yeah i had, that, I had a regatta funny. what's a regatta <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's yeah it depends how sympathetic the school so uh, they were sort of supportive i guess because if you're going away on like camps and things like that do miss a bit of school time yeah, yeah I'm a slash a national team thing in front of them they'll be like yeah all right free pass i don't know it depends on the school yeah well, i think I, I sort of only made the national team when I was at college. So oh, okay, I started yeah. Yeah. rowing towards the end of school. Um, and I think the most encouragement I got from my teachers was because I was quite a fat kid. They suddenly started seeing me losing a bit of weight and putting on a bit of muscle. I was like, oh, okay. I don't notice the appearance. I'm not old enough to really, mm -hmm. I mean, days before social media took off, I wasn't noticing how my body was changing, but they were. Yeah. And so for me, that was like, okay, I'll, I'll keep this going for a little bit longer. And then when it was at college, 
um you know you suddenly move into the junior scene and you know that's when it steps up a bit more it gets a bit more challenging but luckily you're of age to learn how to drive so then cycling to and from college goes out the window and yeah you start driving around a bit more but um no, i think that's the benefit the under 23s at the time or the juniors sorry there weren't many training camps they went to non a few times and, i don't uh, mean the number one I that was about it race. well the one that i really i didn't make was then one where you turned up and it was like frozen the yeah whole time yeah I remember the stories that came back from that was Phil Clapp's back exploding on a half hour erg. Oh, that was the in Nottingham. Was that Nottingham? That was the start of the season. Yeah, he was next to me. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> the other one was, um, I probably, I can't quite remember her name, but I won't say anyway. There's a girl that threw up on herself with like a couple of minutes left to go on the half hour and <laughs> okay. it just kept going. Yeah. Do you, do you remember? I don't remember that, but there was a guy at Brooks that did exactly the same thing on his 20 minute test just dribbling down his front <laughs> I've got more respect for this that throws up and keeps going yeah like that's pretty brutal what are you going to do you've got two minutes left yeah go on with it okay. yeah just got to um, crack on and then spring assessments mm. was just absolutely brutal yeah I did that in my in my last year so oh seven. Oh my god I couldn't believe it just, I remember thinking when I came to Leander that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Like four days, 15, 1500s, yeah. four days in a row, like absolutely. And I came to the end, it was like, it's going to be like that. It's going to be like that every day. Yeah. And it was like 16K in weight. So I was like, oh, this is okay. Like, <laughs> like literally nothing measured up to spring assessments. It was yeah. horrific. Yeah. No, that was sucked. I think, mean, again, with that, I just went in it as a complete unknown. You know, in my first junior year, um, I had like a really run down club single. I think it was called Kurt. It was like half red, half white, like an old school Yanni or something. And I hadn't I feel like I actually remember you rowing in that. I hadn't t I hadn't rigged it properly at all. My dad took me down on the roof of our car. Um, my coach was still at the club, so we just went together. And within about four hundred meters, my footplate just snapped clean off. And I was like pushing and then pulling myself back up the slide and pushing and pulling the whole way down. And I think I came fifty second in that. But then my coach like said, don't worry, we'll take you back. Yeah, Boston trials. Oh, wait, I came back. And I basically, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make it through any of the trials. Like 50 seconds, you don't get called back. Yeah. My coach was like, oh, don't worry, we'll take you back. And so I went to the Munich trials, lost that, had to go home with Donald Leggett. And uh, I didn't get through that. And then he was like, right, we'll take you to the next one. And that was the final trials. And um, I was in a pair with Don Merrick Cole at the time. Uh, no, Don, and we yeah. had to do the race off to get into the seat race. Yeah. And we managed to win that to get into seat What year was that? That was 2007. I was in that. I and then we that, I was in that race through that. I was in that with um, Ollie Cook was in it as well. Oh, yes. And there was a couple of Latimer boys in it. And yeah, I didn't make it. So we, I did the time trial was fast enough to get into the to the thing for final trials, to yeah. get into the thing, to the, the pairs matrix. And then I didn't go fast enough in the pairs matrix. Yeah. And go, you, you fucking beat me. <laughs> Just knocked me out of it. <laughs> well, I remember being in the pair. And that was the first time I met Sachi. What side were you wearing? Bow side. In the pairs matrix, yeah, yeah, so we probably rode together, potentially, because I would have been on stroke side. I, was, I definitely remember Sachi, and I remember final trials pairs matrix. Yeah, in 07. seven. Yeah, yeah. How exactly. weirdly? Well, the only reason I remember Sachi was because I, I heard two juniors talking about some kid's ergo score, and that oh, I done like a, a six ten or something at the time. My PB was a six twenty, yeah. and I got in this boat. And I was like, right, these guys are ahead of us. That bloke's just done a six ten, and then Saturday sort of looks at me. I was like, "Give a fuck! I've just done a six oh eight. Got it right. Let's have it then. And we overtook the boat in front of us. I was like, "Sweet, <laughs> <laughs> done." I remember at spring assessments on the last day, like halfway through the last day, um, we stopped, and then they made an announcement. They were like, "Right, uh, these are the names that are going to go out and do a bit more racing, and two pairs we're going to sit out." And it was like George Nash and Callum Wright are going to sit out. Yeah. Like, I was like, okay, obviously they're at the top. And then Tom Clark and Tom White from RGS are going to sit out. And I was like, I don't think we're sitting out for the same reason. <laughs> Try you in the Cox's four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was like, pretty confident there are, there are two different reasons for those yeah. pairs. <laughs> but you're right, like, you just turn up and you just get binned. And yeah. Like, I look back and think, like, how many times did I turn up with with all the enthusiasm and like, this, this time, you know, maybe I'll do it and you just get smashed and smashed and smashed. Yeah. But you just have to keep going Starting Start in the Cox fours and then by the end of the week, you work your way up into the Cox's fours. Yeah. And you still don't have a clue what you're doing. No one does. No one had a clue. <laughs> and I remember I was just going there to help Dom get in the team. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I really called my parents when they did the team announcement and they called me originally to be in the eight. Oh, yeah. 
and um, we had to do a race off to see if the eight was fast enough. And I think it was the um, the cocked four with Callum in it. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't fast enough. So they took those four, put oh, them into the yeah. stern of the eight, and then got rid of the bow four of the eight. But luckily, I was in the three seat of the eight, so I went into the pair. And I think okay. like Webby and people like that went into the coupe four. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, phew, that saved me. But then I had to call my parents who were waiting for me to join them in Mallorca. And they were asking when I was flying out. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm not. I've got to go to Worlds. And they're like, why are you going to Wales? I'm like, no, I'm going to Worlds. I was like, what's happening in Wales? <laughs> and then they found out that I had to go to Worlds. And then we realized that it was in Beijing. Yeah, Beijing, yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. So I had to call family and friends to give me whatever currency I needed. Because, you know, two days later, you're off to Chester to do a, a training yeah, camp. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never left the country by myself. And they never look back. <laughs> that was, uh, sometimes ignorance is a bit better. Yeah. I guess, like, was that, did that help with, like, not having too much nerves and just kind of being yeah. like, oh, cool, like, here I am. Let's yeah, no, go. definitely. And that's, you know, talk about it later with the Saudi stuff, but that's most recently at the Paris Worlds with our boy Omar. Yeah. That's what I said to him, I said, enjoy this. Yeah. Like, you are ignorant to everything that's to come. There's no pressure on you at all. Yeah. Just enjoy the opportunity to race the best juniors in the world yeah take all the stress off your shoulders and just learn as much as you can and yeah that was my first time at beijing the pre-olympics and i had no idea what i was doing i was racing a guy called matt anker coached by mark woodcock in the pair you know my race rate was 30 if i was lucky i couldn't get any high i'd never stroked a pair before in my life yeah and then bit by bit learned from each race and ended up winning the b final and then that sort of set me in stone for what i wanted to do from point onwards so from that point was it then like right well, i'm I want to take this seriously now. Yeah, yeah. I sort of had a point to prove because I was like the ultimate fanboy. I've still got the photos on my laptop somewhere. I was in fanboy there taking pictures of all the A finals and I got these pictures of like Kieran, Jack and George and everyone in, in the Coxus 4 going yeah. through winning their gold medal. Yeah. And every time we rode past them in training sessions, Mark would be like, look how he's doing that. Look yeah. how he's doing that. And it was always about how Kieran had such a nice quick catch. It's like, just copy that hand placement. Yeah. Like, okay, coach. So I was always trying to mimic Kieran. Yeah. <laughs> How, how like, did you find China for your first junior worlds as well? Yeah, I mean, I was petrified of flying when I first went out there. And I remember flying out, I had a Radley boy next to me who was just dead to the world, just fast asleep and hit really bad turbulence. And I was by the window just shitting it, looking at it like, oh my God, watching the wing doing this. <laughs> and he was fast asleep. He sort of woke up like, oh, what's going on? And then I sort of looked, we're in big turbulence. And he was like, ah, oh, went straight back off to sleep. I was like, what's going on? Like clenching the sides, hoping the plane doesn't fall out of the sky. But when we got there, it was a great experience. You know, I think we had a really good group of juniors out there with us. Uh, we had Craig Williams, the physio. He always makes everyone laugh and makes light of all the situations. Um, but the conditions were horrible for sort of the racing leading into it. It was so smoggy. You know, you almost felt borderline asthmatic. Everything oh. you did, it was very hard to breathe. It was very humid, very smoggy. Yeah. But then day one of racing, gone. Didn't they think Clear they did the cloud skies. seeding overnight? I think so, yeah. yeah. It was perfect conditions. I mean, it was hot, it was humid, but no smog, nothing. It was it was nice, yeah. I yeah, think they tested that out for the Olympics. I'm pretty sure they said the Olympics, they used cloud seeding to make sure you do it overnight and it rain, you can make it rain. And then the next day, it's definitely clear. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. It's the future. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so then next year, still at college, but taking it pretty seriously. I guess then you're, you're now going to start rowing with people like Kieran. Yeah, so from, from college, jumping into Brooks. Yeah. And um, I was thinking about it on the way over here. My my life at Brooks was basically set in stone from our very first welcome speech from Henry. So I think I was, as you said, like keen as mustard, always rowing. Every summer holiday was spent rowing. I got told I could come to Brooks a week early before Freshers started to carry on training. So I was there a week before Freshers, training with all the senior boys like Chris Abraham, Scott Durant, people like that, just yeah. getting in there early. And then uh, Freshers Week starts, you bring all these like like a hundred students into the the old gym and you sit them all down and he gives everyone a welcome speech. Um, and then he sort of it's winding down. He's like, oh, hang on a minute. Special mention. We got Matt Tarrant sat on the front row, just came back from the junior world, world silver medalist. Everyone give him a round of applause. Everyone starts clapping. He's like, now shut the fuck up. This is not juniors. This is Brooks. Now we mean business. <laughs> and from that point onwards, it was like me and Henry were like, we would clash at times, but I think that's what got the most out of me. And you hear a lot of those stories about, you know, tourist dinners here and Steve Williams talk about his early days and, you know, what it took 
for the coaches to get his fight out of him and what happened once he found that fight. You know, for me, I loved it at Brooks and that was sort of day one. That's where it was set for me <laughs> from that I point a, onwards. That's, but... I had a place at Brooks and then I got, we got told about the Leander development program. So I deferred it a year. So instead of going in 07, I was supposed to go in 08. And, but then that first year at Leander, like we ended up winning Henley like at the end of Thames. We had some humdingers with Brooks through the year, but by the end of the year, we were sort of beating Brooks and Durham. And I was like, oh, I mean, I want to see where this rowing thing is going to go. Mm. And I think for me, like probably Leander suited me better. I think what I think the mental side of things I had a bit better. I think I wasn't that great a rower. <laughs> and, uh, so I think Leander focus a lot more on the technical side of things. Yeah. Whereas what Brooks does really well is take good rowers and make them into men, I guess. And women. Yeah. I think I don't know how how they do it now, but I think it's it's come a long way for sure, yeah. Since since our day. You always talk about back in my day we did this, yeah. we did that. And I think you know, I don't know what they're doing now. I think it, it probably was a lot harder back in the day. But I think now they've sort of I think what Henry's doing and Spratly are doing are great. They've they've learned that you don't need to flog a dead horse to get it to produce scores and make it work harder. You know, just like you say, take a very good athlete, teach them how to push past what they thought were barriers before, and then like sprinkle the dust on top with this is our technical model. If you all do it together, it will work. And you get years and years of results. It puts more and more faith in the program and the technical model. Yeah. And it just it's like a wheel. It just keeps rolling. Yeah. It's like an upward spiral. You could almost like call it. Yeah. I think what's good about Brooks is like, obviously in his hate, you know, when Henry was there and Ben Lewis and Steve Williams and Alex Partridge, and that was that was like a pinnacle. And then there was sort of a point where it dipped a bit. They like say like when I was at Leander 08, 09, 10, and the Leander Thames Cup 8 would by the end of the year beat the, the best Brooks 8. So there was like a point where it wasn't quite like that. So the fact that they've brought it back mm. really proves that like what Henry's doing work. He hasn't just like got a system that works and and like continued it. Like they had to bring it back. Yeah. And now you see, yeah, Brooks being being Leander Ladies Plate Eight in the final. Uh, yeah. Like really pushed. The it's just it's just the sheer numbers as well. The sheer yeah. number of athletes. It's impressive. You know that that for my first year there, oh nine, when we when we did the Henley, you know we were the Cox four. We had a Temple Eight, and I think we had. Like maybe another four, then three or four women, and that was it. And now you go there, and it's just eight after eight after eight after eight Do after eight, eight, after, eight yeah. after eight after eight, and it's like what? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. huge. We serviced their machines recently, and they've got seventy-one concept two machines in the gym. So seventy-one. Anyone, yeah, any one time, seventy-one athletes can just sweat it out. And no, as, four. as some of our friends have pointed out, Brooks yeah. like to create a little steam room. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> forty ergs and thirty-five bikes, something like that. Yeah, crazy. It's all in the same room with a carpet floor. Yeah, it was, probably with the same playlist, uh, day in, day out. <laughs> That's what we have. We have one CD mixtape that someone made, and it's just that was the same playlist. Day I was day always out. really freaked out, right, whenever I got invited to Brooks, because I was like, I'd never done juniors or anything. We, we did some like training stuff in the eight ones, whatever. You guys had done juniors like you and Scott and Carl Hud Smith and Chris Abrahams, and like Carl was just really weird. I didn't really get him. Mm. Like we, there was that one time when we all went for breakfast, and Carl just like the the. Um, the field had flooded because the drain had blocked. So rather than come to breakfast, he just waded into the field and like shoveled, like unblocked the drain <laughs> in the break. And I was like, I don't really get this guy. Yeah. Like I was a bit worried. I was a bit scared of him. And then Chris Abrahams, I just didn't understand. Yeah. I was like, you know, like when you've asked, you've said like, what? Like four times. You're yeah, like, really I, thick. I, I can't say what again. <laughs> I'm just going to have to be like, okay, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> and then Henry was scary. Like, cause I didn't know him. Yeah. So it freaked me out a bit writing there, but there's some sort of fun sessions. Yeah. No, it was funny. The stories you hear about Carl as well. I remember when he did Youth Olympics, I wasn't there for that one, but they told they had to uh, make their kit wet before they go on the water. Mm. Um, and so he put his whole kit bag on and jumped in the shower and then turned up to the minibus just with everything soaking wet. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's good to row with, though. Yeah. It was good to row. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, you know, a little bit weird, but you know and we all a tough yeah, that, yeah that's the thing with rowers yeah. i'm always told now i'm autistic by my missus but <laughs> i think there's i think some... everyone's got a little bit of autism in there if you want to if you if you sign up to hurt yourself yeah. day in day out whether it's mentally stressing yourself on a 20k ergo or you know hurting yourself on a 2k test there aren't many people that want to voluntarily do that to themselves well yeah, yeah if you come into the sport normal as 
as you would be, you definitely leave this port autistic or like with some form of <laughs> autism because you're just like staring down the, the the monitor of the earth for just hours and hours and then yeah. that's going to do something weird to your brain. I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah, you go some pretty weird places on those long ergos. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about it the other day with someone, weren't we? Like the weird stuff. It was Webby actually told me once, he was like, on the long eggs, I just count up to 50 and down to zero on repeat. For the whole thing. I was like, you're insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like you, what the hell? Just stroke, just up to 50. And then when he hits 50, he'll just count down to zero. I zero, can't do just, that. <laughs> I was like, I just, I just start daydreaming about things. Yeah. Oh. I used to do this thing where I'm counting how many minutes or distance what I've got remaining and try and calculate what percentage that is of like the entire session and then how that plays out into like this, well, you this just, week's training, like the mileage and stuff. It's just weird stuff to occupy your mind. Yeah, yeah, you convince yourself like it's a 12K and you're like, okay, well, it's 8K left. So there's 2K till 6K and 6K is halfway and then it's just 3, 2K. Yeah. You would just kind of try and... <laughs> you get in here, like, all right, 3K to go. What have I got? Three songs to go. Yeah. I just listen. <laughs> Those three songs are going to carry me home. I'd count. I'd, put, I'd count like the last K out in strokes, maybe. But yeah, I always in my in the back of my mind, without even thinking about it, I just clock into the home stretch, like where I learned to row at Weybridge. Oh, I've yeah. just got that whole last three K just mapped out in my head, and nice. it's like three and a half K. There's this three K. There's that. Then I go on to Walton Bridge, round the Blue Bridge Bend, past yeah. the pub. <laughs> I got all the markers <laughs> in yeah, my head, just reeling them off. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I remember like um, we went and did this. They had some corporate day at Dorney and like all the senior athletes away. So they took some of the under 23s and it was like, right, it was like coming up to 2012. And then we, we did like a little ergo challenge and they asked us some questions and stuff. And they were like, oh, so like what's different about like, like if you go to it, like if you made the team in, in uh, at Dorney, like what would be different about it? And I was like, well, like you've rode here so much. Like I don't look for the 500 meter sign. I look for the tree. Hmm. There's that big tree just yeah. before. So like, you know, yeah. when you see the tree, like, you know, it's coming. So it's like, there's just, different markers like when you yeah. know a course it's just yeah locked in. that was the thing you know i lived with um pete chambers yeah and obviously they had that humdinger in the lightweight four yeah and you ask him what was it like rowing at, at dorney for the limit it's like oh, it was like metal marlow yeah you know, it's the same lake you see the green light you go <laughs> it's that simple <laughs> i mean that's a classic pete response though, right? yeah. yeah yeah you know don't don't build it up in your mind to be something bigger than it is you know? I remember. I don't know if you were in it. We once we did an twenty three camp. We did a like a weight session in Bisham, and we then we drove to Caversham. And I was in my old VW camper. Oh and, yeah, with and, the rusted effect. Is that no, one? no, no. I, that not the rust car. I had like a old VW camper van. Okay. And uh, I once drove it to Brooks, and the the, the roof popped up. I don't know if you were in that one either. <laughs> anyway, halfway to the drive, like the a bearing in the gearbox just exploded. And Pete Chambers just absolutely pissing himself in the back. Just, <laughs> we're like, just like, <laughs> like pulled into Caversham. Like Pete Shepard, oh, that doesn't sound very good. Just yes, I know. Piss <laughs> off. I know my car's broken. Like, oh, I'm so annoyed right now. I'm you a know. rower. I earn no money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do you expect me to drive? <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah. So I guess like under 23s, going through that, like that experience, I guess, like I said, you're at Brooks, you're doing under 23s, you're taking it pretty seriously. Is it ramping up? Are you feeling, are you sort of approaching things differently as you get further along or? At Brooks? It's just at Brooks, under 23, it's like working uh, through those. Obviously, you had four competitions. We did one one together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not, not particularly. I think, you know, I was quite a boring student, especially in my last year. I was meant to be the captain of the boat club. And I think I went out for the very first, like, freshers, welcome drinks into Fuzzy Darts, the three-legged pub crawl. And I think that was the last social I had that year. For me, it was just get the dissertation done as soon as I can mm. so I can focus on my rowing. Um, and then I think it just it was by chance, you know, we went to Caversham to do our seat racing for the Worlds. And um, out of the blue, Shep was like, okay, what I want to try and do is these are the four combinations, but I want Matt and um, Kieran to go out and try the pair. And he said, if you can achieve these percentages, we'll leave you in the pair. Mm -hmm. I think we went out there and we did like a, a 95, a 96, and a 96%, 1,500 off, off the blocks. And he's like, okay, we'll, we'll leave it there. And so from that point onwards, we're like, okay, well, we're the pair. That's cool. And you get to just row around and see everyone else going through hell and you're half smug about it. But then you realize, <laughs> actually, we've got to try and make this work. Um, yeah. I mean, I think at that point, we only had a week before the World Champs because it was all very close being Olympic year. And so you got thrown together, you had one week to try and make that boat go as fast as you can. And then you're off, you're off to track eye to try and bring back the medals. Yeah. 
Was that a tough? Well, uh, how did that go with the goal? I guess this is so silver and a junior, so this would be first sort of uh, world championship gold medal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think were you at Fizu? No, so I was never a student. So oh yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, okay. So yeah, we did that, and then the pair. I think it was. I just had no idea what I was doing. Really, I think I took a lot. <laughs> again, I just took a lot of confidence in having Kieran in the boat with yeah. me. Uh, and he in the bow seat he was a proper drill sergeant and yeah. he would just lay into me all the time was always just trying to like get get the like the aggressive side of me out um but and henry was our coach and you know we went out there not really knowing what we could do we knew we had good base speed because you know sometimes you just get in a boat and it, it just clicks and i think we were lucky to just have that click from the very first stroke um and we sort of, but again, you have no idea how you're going to do until that first race. And we won the heat, we won the semi, we won the final. We sort of ticked them all off as we went along. Nice. But my funniest memory from that was that Henry was trying to give us every advantage. And so he took great pride in how he cleans the boat. And I think we boated for our semi final and everything was just shining in the light. It waxed absolutely everything, including the inside of the gates. And so we're rowing off to our paddle and we like take a shot and, and our blades get pulled out because he's just waxed everything. <laughs> and we tried doing a couple of bursts and our blades kept coming out of the, uh, out of the yeah. gates themselves. So in the end, we just sort of like start scratching at them, like splashing water on. One of us took our tops off and we're like buffering this wax <laughs> off the gate sort of 10 minutes before you get on the start blocks to race your semi. But uh, no, it was good fun. And I think I've always seen myself as an underdog. Hmm. I never went out there thinking I was I was the best guy. I never had that sort of self-confidence in me with rowing. And it was only, that was the first time I thought like, ah, oh, I've done all right. And then the next day I was like, right, Europeans is up. I'm now the underdog again. I was going to say, like, did you have a minute to enjoy it? Or were you just yeah. like, next? And I think that minute for me enjoying it was we came back, we had a beer on the finish line and we we're cheering for the rest of the team to come through. And it's almost like, for the most stressful thing for that was I knew that we could win it. And the only thing that was going to stop us winning it was if, me or him mucks up yeah and he had an issue with his forearms at the time so i think i rem remember in the last 500 meters i was like oh, i'm gonna build it up he's like no don't forearms he just wish out forearms and we just sort of hold it mm. through the line um but no it was a lot of fun the after parties are always good fun as well <laughs> that's good i remember in 09 i shared a room with kieran and that was the year in uh in, in prague where they cancelled the after parties and we had the new zealands and the aussies came to, to our hotel. hotel do you remember yeah and we were pretty pissed. And we were, we were back in our room, but like people were like running up and down the hallway. It probably wasn't even that late, but everyone was quite drunk. And like Shep comes up and says, like, right, everyone, you know, in your room, in your room. Gets everyone else in their room. I'm lying in bed, but Kieran's like at the doorway, like still just trying to mess about. And then Shep comes to the door and it's like, Kieran, come on, it's time to go to bed. Time. And Kieran's like, no, wait, wait, wait. I just need to, I need to do that. No, you don't need to do anything. Yeah, I just, I, I need to know what the time, what's the time. Kieran, it's late. You don't need, he's like, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on. Shep, 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 Shep. And Shep's like, what? And he just goes like, thanks for everything, Shep. <laughs> it's quite all right, Kieran. Now go to bed. <laughs> I was just listening to that in the room. Just being like, that's nice. <laughs> uh, the other thing from N23s I was saying to Pete the other day, you won't remember, in 2000, or you might remember, in 2011, towards the end of seat racing, I don't think I'd seat race anyone, but then Shep swaps. We, I, we race and... Uh, the four I'm in like wins by quite a lot. It gets like quite far out ahead. And then he shot swaps me and Phil Congdon. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is clearly like one of the last seats for this eight. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, like we're up against it now. Like this, this four I've just come out has like, absolutely shot up. And I think before, so I sat behind you in that boat and like before I probably said like, oh, come on boys, I can fucking really want to, really want to get this. Like I don't want to miss out on this eight because I could see like you're going to be in it. Satch is going to be in it. Pat Lepage, Andy Holmes. Like, yeah. Fucking, well, I want to make this eight. And we started and they pissed off like big time. I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And I remember like coming past Caversham and I remember said something to you. I was like, mate, I fucking need it. I, thought, I, I need you now. Like, let's go. Yeah. And you fucking ripped that ball off. <laughs> like, Last and it, was, it was so <laughs> ugly. It was so, it, it was not, it did not feel nice. It did not look nice. But we just somehow just like dragged our way back. Yeah. From one that sea race. And I was like, Thanks, mate. <laughs> That's the thing. Those dirt, those dirty last sprints, <laughs> sort of they they always start and stick with you. My biggest moment with that was, I think it was our first attempt at putting a four together in 2017, uh, the senior four, and 
who do we have? We had Callum in the boat with us. Uh, Mobriety. Callum, yeah, Callum yeah, Mobriety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so he was in there with us. And I think it was our heat, and we're in third place coming into the last 250. And then just he and I just went full turbo, and he led the charge from behind me. He was like, oh, okay, here we go. He has some raw power. And we just he? went for it, and you went from third place to first place in 250 meters. <laughs> and yeah. That was our first experience of rowing with Sachi, gold medal stroke in the eight, yeah. Mo, gold medal, three man, uh, two man of the four, and then us two choppers in there. It's like, here we go. Those two are just used to getting out, commanding and winning. And it took us a very long time to sort of find our speed and come through. But I yeah. remember watching Callum on the egg sometimes just be like, this kid doesn't know how strong he is. Like, yeah. He just doesn't know. Like there's so much in there. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> obviously like winning under 23 is must have felt amazing. Like I'm surely you didn't approach every race after that as an underdog. You, mu you must have taken on like some pride in like your abilities. Um. Well, no, because... You know, I went straight from under 23s into the senior squad. So and that so, was your last year of under 23s? Yes, yeah, so my last year of under 23s yeah, was 2012. That's when we were running that European project scene, like with the athletes who were like not under 23 that year, but mm -hmm. were looking to get into it. And then, then these guys came in. So you yeah. literally won a medal and then jumped straight into the boat that was going to compete at senior Europeans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and but we, I think our main advantage was we came back Oh, like a couple of weeks before the seniors, didn't we? Because they, they have the longer holiday after the Olympics. Yeah. I remember, so I was already quite fit. And then Andy Hodge walks into the room and they're just starting to get back into shape again. And it was in the old gym right next to the window. He sits down to my right. And I think I had Pete to my left and it was a 12K or something. Oh. And I absolutely smashed them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like laying down my marker right there and then. Did you do the hands of cup that year as well? Um, did you back out of it? I didn't do I didn't do the hands there. I did... I can't remember how many hands as I did. I did quite a few. Yeah. I went to the, I think I did the Hamburg sprints. I went oh, to the maybe, Hamburg yeah. sprints as the shoe boy yeah. with a senior team. I didn't actually get to take part in it. There was a point where I was going to jump into the Australian eight because one of them had to do like some sort of naughty boy test. Oh, right. And if that came back positive, I would have had his seat in the boat, uh, but it didn't. It was negative. So he was allowed to race. Uh, so I was just there, the shoe boy, running the shoes about. And then I went to the hands of cup after that. But I can't remember what year that was in. I remember that Europeans 8 being like tough, like a tough summer. Mm. Again, I feel like same with you, like feeling like one of the last people in the boat, like Fred's in it. I think, mean, well, Gotra would come in late, but like Scott's in it, those names and stuff. I remember like working my ass off because telemetry's on the boat. Yeah. And then they sit me like... Ta um, I think it was like Tanner sits me down like it's like right your, your your watts are just like off what everyone else is doing like you need to work harder and I was like <laughs> what like yeah. I'm already not you this is not UT2 and now you're like you need to work harder yeah I just like I also feel like pretty bad for like um Fred got an absolute hammering from from Christian didn't he well, they do because they just hated the way he rode yeah the you know, quite, the... quite tight shoulders was yeah. like this dude he rode he rode for cambridge yeah like, he looked he was an animal in the strokes here the cambridge eight like he won that thing he like won it by a long stretch and yeah. you know similar to some of the guys it doesn't have to look pretty yeah. but actually you look at their performances on the water and it does something but especially in that system you know you're under the microscope every single day and they want you row in a particular way yeah and they will try everything they can to make you conform to that way yeah. And, you know, for some people, it's just so ingrained. It's incredibly hard to change. And if you do make the change, typically you'll get injured because your body's not used to moving that way. Yeah. So yeah. I don't want to see how pretty your rowing is after the performance director of the GB rowing squad sits you down and tells you you need to pull harder. <laughs> <laughs> but it was brutal. I swear, I was like, I was like threshold. I was doing like every day, I was doing like 30K at threshold. Like, oh, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I know I had the opposite experience to you I remember when we got back when we started training with the seniors yeah and we were back like three weeks earlier and then we had like a half hour like the week came back I sat next to um Alex Gregory and I was like oh, I'm mm. gonna do it like he's literally not done anything for like eight weeks yeah and he still just beat me I was like what the hell like you've done nothing for eight weeks <laughs> and you just sat here and beat me on the half hour I was like what the yeah. hell that was one of his biggest strengths the longer the distance for him the better yeah just the silky efficiency of <laughs> of Gregor's so <laughs> straight through <laughs> uh yeah so I guess like going into seniors um leaving uni I mean that must have been a big thing like that was something I always sort of thought when I'm uh, coming through under 23s I was like okay I'm keeping up with you guys 
but I'm just doing Leander and then, yeah, I've got my little part-time job, but I'm basically full-time already. Whereas you guys are doing a degree, dissertation, trying yeah. to fit some partying in or some social life in some way. Just one how section did, a day. How did, that was it? Yeah. Just in the evenings? Yeah. Monday, well, the Mondays when I was there was the 220 minutes, max effort. And then the Tuesdays and the Thursdays were just like, I think it was either a 10K run to kick the session off I always had dodgy knees, so I would do like a 45 minute or an hour UT2. And then once everyone is back from the run, you will meet together and do the Brooks circuit, which is yeah. a bunch of body weight movements. And you, you go through that sort of 10 times racing each other. And then they have these um, barbells on the wall that are spray painted like gold, silver, and bronze. And all the men had to take the gold bars off the wall if you're big enough. And they're only 40 kilos. But you know, by the end of the year, you're doing 660s of certain exercises wow. and 40 kilo gets very heavy when you're <laughs> you're doing that many reps and so that was basically your session you train it either four or six it's two to three hours long wow and that was that was basically the markers of my of my rowing career i went from being a junior rowing a couple of times a week to brooks i couldn't walk for my first year at brooks got used to that went to the senior team couldn't walk for my first year of the senior team got used to that yeah so you know those were markers like okay we're stepping on yeah. i should start seeing some progress now because my body is knackered yeah yeah you go to a place it's just you just can't believe how tired you are sometimes yeah, yeah. so people said like the transition from under 23s to senior is just a different level of volume yeah it's not even like the intensity it's just so much volume you just want to snap all the time yeah I mean, it, because you don't really get as much rest as you want uh you know because everyone you don't get to go away and then come back in the evening yeah you know for a lot of the coaches it's their full-time job and they don't want to be there from eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night they just want to do the usual nine to five you know get in get out and so for us we sort of similar you know we didn't want to have to be there any longer than we had to so you normally do your first session at bisham do some weights then you come down do a couple of hours on the water and then you know if you can give yourself an hour give yourself an hour by the end of it, people were sort of starting to have more rest time uh, because some of the older guys would start coming down quite hard on you if you tried getting on with the training too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when you're young, you can do that. But definitely towards the end, I was one of those old boys giving the new ones a hard time, like slow down a bit, mm. take your time, yeah. do the training. But yeah, you'd be sat in the crew room, just on a table like this, just head on your hands, just sort of drifting in and out of consciousness. Then you wake up like, oh, I've got 16K, I go walk downstairs put your kit on get on with it yeah that's definitely one thing i struggled with like um on the face of it the program obviously leander's basically runs like a mini version of the squad so I was, I was used to that type of training and that type of sessions but it was just completely like unforgiving like there was at leander like if you were a bit knackered for third session you'd go home chill for a bit come back in the evening do it before dinner yeah like we were eating dinner there anyway we all lived in henley so you could do that and then the other thing is like Quite often at Leander, yeah, second session on Saturday after pieces is supposed to be 16, but the coach sees everyone's knackered, so they cut it to eight or 10 yeah. and do it a bit more technical. Whereas like a GB, like there was just never, there was, it was never, it was just always, you do it, you do it. No one cares if you're knackered. Yeah. You just do it. And the rare occurrence, if, if say Jürgen did cut it, he'd be like, oh, 16K, they're a bit tired. Okay, we'll do 12K. And then you quickly find out that that 16K three days later has turned into a 20K. Yeah. And so the weekly mileage isn't affected at all. If he wants to hit 200K that week, you're still going to hit it. He'll just add that mileage that he's taken off somewhere and add it somewhere else. <laughs> Jack said after one of his, uh, or after his back injury in Sierra Nevada, um, Jürgen was like, okay, I'm going to alter the program a little bit for you. What I'm going to do is uh, you're not going to do the last 2K on the, of the 16K, Jürgen, you're going to do it on a bike. And he's like, it fucking takes me longer to do it on the bike than it does to take. Yeah, by the time you got off the ergo, set the bike up and do it. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, talking about Fred Gilligan. Shout out, Fred, if you want to come on. Um, he messed up. He had diabetes and we're out yeah. in Sierra Nevada. And he, he, he just, he was amazing at controlling it. But one, he just messed up, had, had to stop, absolutely like stopped at like well, first session, like 8K or whatever, get sent back to his room. And then, like, second breakfast, like, said to Jürgen, so, you know, I'm like, I'm like, do I have the rest of the day off now or something? He's like, nope. We'll see you for second session. Yeah. Was it his birthday or something? Was it? I think so. I'm pretty sure it was, like, his birthday. Was it? Like that. He had to he had to make up mileage. And so he spent his birthday afternoon by himself on the running track doing a 16 -day. Oh, yeah. We didn't even have an erg next. We yeah. had, like, weights. So we all went and did weights. And then he had to go back and yeah. finish it. Finish his ergo. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that was your birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, my birthday always fell on the Banyolas um, winter camp in Gen- January that we used to go on with Leander. It's for like seven years. Nearly. Was that good or bad? It was a weird one because it was like you felt a little bit depressed being like, oh, I'm like not going to see how my family have any presents or anything today. Yeah. But at the same time, I'd kind of have this thought and be like, like, what the fuck else do you want to be doing? Like, yeah. you're, you're living your dream right now. Like, you're out on training camp, like in Spain on the Olympic venue. Like, like mates. Yeah. And, like, yeah. and it was good. So it's like the double edged thing. And I was, I was kind of take that power from that in like the old classic thing of like training on Christmas or whatever. It's like, I'm always like out in Banyolas doing high mileage yeah winter camp on my birthday like yeah yeah and i I almost take pride in saying the same thing like my birthday's in july and so even from the age of like 15 i was either seat racing or competing like my 16th birthday i was in home pier point doing the seat racing i think thrust bought me out like a a birthday cake in the shape of a handbag i was like oh your mum called me she told me it was your birthday (laughs) Brought, brought this handbag cake out in front of all the other juniors and then from that point onwards, that's that's you know that was my birthday. Every, yeah. every year I was either seat racing or competing. Sometimes I would be in Lucerne racing there, but you know, the worst one was actually in Silvretta. Yeah, I was. I don't know if it was before Rio. I was definitely in a pair with Noddy. I don't know if it was in preparation for the Cox pair, but I'd been subbing into the eight. And I think deep down, I was like, oh, I think I'm getting pretty close to actually securing my spot here. I, don't, I think I was filling in for Tom Ransley or someone who was had like an illness. And I think I'd been in there for about four days at that point and it was going pretty well. Nice. And um, there was my birthday, woke up. I was just walking to the other hotel to get my breakfast and Noddy's on the landing. So he's like, oi, Darren, what the fuck? I looked down and he stood there with the blaze. He's like, we're going rowing. He's like, what are you talking about? No, I'm going to get my... You're not in the eight. You're in the pair, 20k. <laughs> like what? <laughs> I turned around, walked straight back to the hotel, put my Lycra on and we just had 20k with minimal coaching. And on the way back, it's like, it's your birthday today, isn't it? I was like, yeah. It's like, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. I was like, no. <laughs> oh, when you get close, close for a nice cigar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so going on through that, like I say, making two so words, how, how were you sort of illness or injury wise? Did you ever have to deal with some big injuries or? Um, keep yourself healthy that way yeah I don't know I think leading into Rio I think no uh, yeah Rio I sort of had an illness that knocked me out for quite a lot of that season Um, yeah that's why I was in the that year when I was in the Cox pair I had quite a lot of illness that year I don't know where it came from I came back and I was absolutely shattered and there was I think three or four of us athletes that got absolutely hammered by something and I wasn't really up and running for about four or five months. I tried pushing through it. And I remember in Sierra Nevada, Jürgen took me to one side. I was like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, are you resting? Are you going soft? Like, what's going on? And I was like, I'm literally working as hard as I can. I can't function. And then it turned out there was some sort of viral thing that sort of four or five of us had picked up from somewhere yeah. and it completely wiped us out and sort of struggled coming back from that. And Phelan ended up coaching us, yeah. getting us back up and running. So that's when Henry was starting to trial the coxing seat in the eight. And that was a tough year and the Cox pair kicked my ass, but it was a, it was a cool boat to race in. And then, um, I guess the biggest thing I had was, well, I, I had like carpal tunnel and things like that at Brooks, but you sort of manage it. Yeah. Um, but then I had the blood clot in sort of the, the final preparation for the Olympic trial leading into Tokyo. Okay. So that sort of cropped its head up. We used to go to, after South Africa, went to Namibia yeah. for the cycling camp. And halfway through that camp, I started getting pain in my foot. I was like, oh, it's a bit odd. I think maybe I'll do my cleats up too tight or my shoes are too tight or something. But you just, you get on with it. You're doing like 100K a day on the bike, 20K ergos and weight sessions. You know, you're going to feel tired and sore. But I I got back in Joburg Airport and I could put no pressure through that foot at all. I was just limping and hopping around the airport. Got on the flight. It's like 12, 12, 11, 12 hour flight back home. I think Anne was on holiday, so I didn't get to see her for a little while. And so I tried rowing that that week, but I was just losing range of movement through my ankle. I just couldn't really get to full side and my foot was slowly getting bigger and more painful. And so we thought it was an issue with the plantar fascia on the bottom of the foot. And when Jürgen heard about that, he's like, okay, I've had one of those. They're painful. Go get it checked out. I went there, scanned it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's like, oh, there's a little bit of swelling, but nothing crazy. I was like, okay, can you, can you scan my calf as well? I feel like I've sprained 
like torn a muscle or something from limping for so many weeks and then he scanned in my leg and he saw a 10 centimeter so like sausage on the screen Whoa. he was like okay how long's that been there for i was like i don't know like i had been hurting for about four weeks and this clot must have happened around namibia time and it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so we basically just halted everything and that evening was probably the most painful because we were monitoring it quite well with like a, a ice compression boot and like anti inflams and everything and so it wasn't getting massive but then as soon as they put me on a pixaban the uh blood thinners mm -hmm. you're not allowed to take any of that stuff and so i was sitting in the waiting room at the hospital to buy the apixaban and i could just feel my leg getting tighter inside my jeans and my foot was starting to get tight inside my shoe and i was like oh this is getting so painful and we had no idea sort of within british rowing how to deal with it so then i basically wrote my own training program for three months and with sally brown the physio my only marker of my progression was the knee to wall test yeah and when i started my left one had zero like minus numbers i couldn't move it at all whereas my right one was like plus 13. And so over three months, that was my main marker. How much range of movement can I get back through that leg? Started really, really light bikes, like swimming, like upper body only ski erg, and bit by bit getting range of movement back through my leg on the ergo. And, um, you know, after th sort of three months of finding this blood clot and not being able to really walk at all, to then sort of being thrown into the Olympic <laughs> final trial with Sachi, who at the same yeah. time had been out with a herniated disc and yeah. he didn't rode for three or four months either Ooh. you know that was probably the hardest one for me yeah. because up until that point you know i was um i we still talk about it like i think i could have beaten Sachi and mo in their pair when they won that trial me and stuart were coming through them and his the, the nut on his back stay snapped off in the last hundred meters oh damn and so we fell back and then we got overtaken by matt and jacob um so ended up in the top four that that year got the bronze even with Sachi's heart issues and then the following year I won it with Alan and we're in the top boat again that following year I think I was with Tom George I think we didn't do it as well but again you're in the top boat and then you sort of go from top 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 blood clot out not really in the team sort of there you work your way back up you're then thrown into this like really important regatta you come second to last the world goes into lockdown you don't know what's going on <laughs> yeah so that was Same. like a tough period yeah i mean looking back on it it's the things that you did well things that you didn't do well advice you would give to someone if they, if they were in a situation like that i mean obviously not lockdown but just in terms of bringing yourself back from that place or or yeah it not going right the year that you need it to go right sort of thing even, yeah even mentally yeah i think that's the thing i think for me I don't think mentally I, I ever really struggled with it. Whenever something cropped its head up to me, it was like, okay, how can I beat this? And so as soon as I found out about the blood clot, in my head, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's not a season ender. We just got to manage it and figure out a solution. And sort of, I felt more confident in writing my own program because I knew how I was feeling. And I've always been quite tough on myself. So by the end of it, I'm doing three or four sessions a day to try and play catch up and mm. You know, I was fit and I was strong. I was. I remember one time in Aviz, I went out there for that camp and I did a 20k ergo in the morning, but the Norwegian team were in there. And so I had them in the reflection of the window and every now and then I could clock them looking at my machine and I was like, right, here we go. 20k at 145, just got to hold it. And like the last 2k were starting to sting, but you put the handle down, you stand up and you yeah. just walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it look as easy as possible. <laughs> and so I, remember I, I knew I was fit and I knew I was strong, but I was not race fit and strong. I yeah. couldn't get the rate any higher above 28. Um, but I think it's, it's more from an athlete at that level, you always feel like you have to say yes. Mm. Always turn up, always say yes. Mm -hmm. And I think for me and definitely for Sachi as well, you know, we could have gone to Tokyo and brought back medals. And for me, I never got to do that in Rio because I, I lost my seat by a bow ball to Alan and Stu. Um, and then for me, a blood clot is a clear medical exemption. Hmm. You know, you don't have to do an Olympic trial if you've just come back from a blood clot and you clearly have no race prep. But in my mind, I had to do it to prove to the coaches that I was that guy that could step up and I like, hmm. you know, you can rely on me. I'm always going to be there. And it didn't work out. I came second to last. I got thrown into a pairs matrix that didn't really go my way either. We did one day of testing. And then as the world went into lockdown, Jürgen announced the team. And you're like, what? 
we haven't finished testing mm. and that's the way it stayed for the year after so you know i think it's, it's having that good balance of trying to always prove yourself and make yourself that best athlete possible but i think a part of being the best athlete possible is you know having that self-awareness and actually sometimes i think that's what pete reed did very well i mean i know he had the accolades to support his decision making mm. but if something wasn't right he wasn't afraid to have those conversations to you know have his word sort of understood yeah we've had this conversation with other athletes and um certainly when this sort of topics come up and people have said that um sometimes the harder thing is actually to put your hand up and say i'm not right mm. it can feel like you're doing your best by just doing every session and, and running yourself into the ground but actually like the more difficult thing is to is to like mentally be like oh, okay i need to come and, and say something and do this but it's super difficult because you know for me that we, we went in a team together that first year 2013 struggled so much with my back and then i could kind of see that people were like ah oh, you know like if i put him in the boat is his back gonna go again like you can kind of see that happening so then there was like i remember specifically there was like a half hour wednesday i hadn't put performance down for a while i knew my back was struggling but i was like i cut this is not the day that i can be like oh back's hurting a bit so yeah. I just got on the erg and I was like, just accept that I'm going to probably do some irreparable damage yeah. today, but I feel like I need to. So yeah, it's a super, it's a super hard tightrope to work to walk. Yeah, uh, and it's just deciding what works for you. Yeah. I mean, the the other example I have was I think we just came back from a Sierra Nevada camp, and I think it was the first time I did a 550. And I was like, that's a big PB. That's put me pretty high up the rankings in the team. Got off. Jurgen's like at last about time and then just walked off i was like oh okay and then sort of four weeks later we had another 2k test but going into that my heart rate was like 20 beats above like i had quite sniffly i uh, knew something was coming and i was like oh, i can't back out now because everyone's going to think i'm doing it because you know it's a 2k and everyone's afraid of a 2k so i did it and i was like in my head i just need to go 0 0.1 quicker to each 500 and i've done it i broke 550 and I did it for about 750 meters and then just completely blew up. Yeah. Ended up on like a 558 or something. And then Jürgen came across, it's okay, it happens. And then walked off. And I was like, uh, it's sub six when you're ill, mate. That is. I was like, that's a black mark next to my name right there. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. And it's a difficult. And I would say, like, having been a coach, I'm sure you know as well, I would say, like, it is a really hard line to follow because there are those athletes that do need a little shove yeah. and they do need you to sort of drag out what they don't know they have inside them. But then there's others that will that will grind themselves into the ground and it's not always best. You know, I've, I've said this story before, but we did we had some ergo and then they said a super chill, UT2, just UT2. And Ollie Cook finished early and put his score on the board. Mm. And then in front of everyone else still, Jürgen comes up and was like, oh, Ollie, 148, oh, so <laughs> strong. And it's like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit here on this erg and keep doing 52s, like I've been told? Yeah. Or I'm going to, like, jack it up and go jack for it. it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's really important to talk about it, though, because, like, there are other people who can certainly learn from sort of like findings of like how you approach coming back from that injury how athlete after a blood clot should be treated if it's not something that like obviously a federation as british rowing has experience with then we need to like draw conclusions to like avoid that into the future or at least give athletes an opportunity to like not have to prove themselves every single time and constantly feel like they're under selection if you've kind of like proved your place or your seat or selection then there could be like an alternative path to to how you come back from injury so that you can get the best out of the athlete that you know can perform on the day. So, and dialogue on, on, on those sorts of things is, is, is really, really important, I mm. think. Yeah, and I think that that's that, that's always like the topic of conversation. It's like, you know, do you keep pushing the athletes to the point where they break, but actually does that, does that get you the best like the toughest athletes that can keep doing it or do you tread that fine line like okay i think you've done enough and then hope that they keep their foot on the gas until yeah. it matters um because you know i think deep down i think that was where we slipped up for tokyo i think because we didn't open up the selection for those boats leading into it quite a lot of us just got comfortable in our seats you know well, we had really good results at the World Cups. So, you know, for a lot of our crews, it was really going the right way. But, you know, the guys that weren't in the team were still chomping at the hills and getting faster and faster and faster. Like, 
you know, I had the best time of my life in that that sort of four week period leading into Tokyo. I was in a I was in the Shadow Four. We still call it Shadow Four. Um, oh yeah. With Ollie Wilkes, who's just been selected for the four now. Uh, Morgan, who's in the eight, and Harry Glenister as well. You know, we're a bit rough and ready, but you know, we were just there to have fun, put all the other crews under as much pressure as we could, and we just loved it you know we've been racing against each other that whole season like who can get the spare spot because we're not going to get into the end of the boats yeah and so we were just always fighting each other that entire season so you know leading into tokyo for me i was probably the fittest and the strongest and like most technically efficient i'd ever been without without a shout out coming out of coming out of lockdown like living in my one bedroom flat doing three sessions a day on the ergo staring out my kitchen window i just went into full analyst mode like analyzed everything that i was doing down to my nutrition i was it was the first time i've ever turned up winter season and had um gaz tell me i'm too lean and i should start eating more food to survive the winter training usually i'm sort of the full fat milk sort of gold top walking around <laughs> with the spare battery packs on my waist like ah oh, he's gonna survive winter just fine but this time i walked in it's like i had a six pack for the first time i was lean i was mean and like Nah, eat some more pizza put the weight back on again <laughs> um but yeah i mean i sort of lost my trail of thought there talking about pizzas and gold tops no but it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's really it's interesting. that fine line exactly like do you push the do you push all of your athletes so that those that break break and then you're left with the toughest and fittest mm. at the time or do you try and bring the best make try and make make every single athlete be the best version of themselves and then yeah. see who's the fastest coming yeah i think it depends on the size of the squad doesn't it when we spoke to emma dyke in new yeah. zealand like they don't have the numbers to be able to do that in the in the uk maybe we do but then also you know because of the history again we've talked about this before because of the history in britain and how good we have been like jürgen's program is designed that if you survive it you will go to the olympics and compete for a medal yeah and it's like well that's what we're all here for so if i you know if you actually want to go and what your dream is to go and get a medal sit on the stand on the podium you're just gonna have to see if you can withstand this and if yeah. you can great and if you can't that's how it goes it's yeah. not the only way to do it but it's been working yeah it's definitely a lot easier with with a smaller group um and i think that's something that paul thompson sp speaks about you know he said i think um, now i'm in my uh, outside of the athlete life when i go to my coaches conferences People are asking here about how he adapts training sessions to make them more personal for the athletes. Mm -hmm. And really the only way you can do that is potentially on the ergo. You just give them a target split and say like, stick to that. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. You row your own, row your own race. But then obviously the bigger the team gets, the less individualized it can get. And that is sometimes the most you can do. You can tweak the weights program a little bit, but you know, he made the point and I agree with it personally for being in the team. If you suddenly say, oh, this person just needs to get fitter and that person needs to work on his sprint. So this session, you're going to do a couple of 100s, you're going to do a 20K. And that guy's doing his 100 meter There are sprints, he does those, he goes home in half an hour and the other guy's slogging it out for 70, 80 minutes. Pretty soon, half the squad are going to be up in arms like, oh, why am I doing this? Yeah. Why are they doing that? I'm doing this. I deserve that. So it is that fine line. But, you know, I've seen a lot of really talented rowers who have sort of gone through the meat grinder where they have just been pushed because the coach doesn't want them to take their foot off the gas. So you're always under the microscope. You're always being tested. And, you know, backs are always the first thing to go. And, you know, you see a lot of really talented athletes that just fall short because their body lets them down because yeah. there isn't that leniency in the program to, you know, give that athlete the breathing space they need. And so, sort of, you know, it's just that thing about, you know, just being a bit more smarter with it. Yeah, yeah, I saw it when I finished, when I got sent back from the team. Like mentally, I've been struggling so much because my back had just been holding me back and I was just watching you guys keep going forward and I'm just not able, you know, I'm not on the air doing things like that. I went back to Leando and it's like, well, I've already done the winter and squad, so like, I'm not going to stop now. But I've at that point in the team, I didn't have this, the seniority to be able to say, this is what I'm going to do or, you know, or say to it. And, but like at Leander, I did. Been there, done that, come back from the team. Spoke to BT and was like, look, if it's not a test, I'm not doing it on the erg. I was, so I'm going to be on the bike. I'm going to go swimming. I'm going to do all your program. But I'm going to do it my way. Pull the PB, like outside of the team, after having spent like 18 months and two years in the squad, which is a bit ridiculous if you think about it. Like, how could you come out and then and then do that? Um, and yeah, just did what I needed to do for me. But like you said, like that's what I needed for me. But the system has to work for everyone. Yeah. So it's just how it is. Yeah. I've got no 
like no qualms like at the end of the day like the system that I tried to do that if I'd been able to do it like I would have gone with all the other boys but it is what it is like it's my back it's my body it's I can't do any better than that well maybe yeah. maybe, maybe what you could do is obviously as a coach like if you're trying to develop a squad and potentially you don't have like the numbers to run through you could see who needs to like you said some some people need to get stronger some people need to get fitter some people just need that top end sprint finish so you could honestly just maybe vary like the only 10 to 15 percent of the training program for, for those athletes but then then hopefully like everyone else isn't going to be up in arms about people doing different sessions because you still do that base and then you just bury those certain sort of sessions kind of like doing a uni degree where you have like your core modules and then, yeah. and then you sort of like choose different yeah things. and that's that's like the thing as well it's just i think the most difficult thing is getting rid of that competitive mindset i think everyone in the team it's just it's a weird environment you know you say and do things in there you wouldn't say and do in the normal world yeah. you, know, you wouldn't walk into an office and do half the things you do in the team <laughs> I imagine. you know and it, it is a weird environment so like the smallest things are like a ticking time bomb especially when everyone's knackered and everyone's just frustrated and you know for some people they're they're putting a pair combination they don't want to be of that person and it's not going right so they're always a bit a bit etchy and you know, you always get clashing emotions and people like things differently. Uh, and so, you know, you look back and there have been some big bust-ups and arguments over the most stupidest mm. of things. You know, I'm not going to name names here, but there was a certain lady who put two plastic cups and had a had a cup of coffee in two plastic cups and another person on the team got really angry with her, not only because there were plastic cups and there were tea mugs, but she used two plastic cups. And it's like, come on, like... Does it matter? No, it doesn't really matter. But you're in that environment, and it just it just it just yeah. eats at you a little bit differently. But you know, if everyone knew that those alterations to the program are going to benefit you in the long run, you know, it's it, it always sounds it always sounds a little bit too simple to be like, don't worry, he's doing these hundred meter sprints because in the summer that's going to help you win a gold medal. Yeah, it sounds really easy, but in the moment, it's like. Yeah, but he can do them after the session. Like, why can he do that as an extra? Like, I don't want to do 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's so boring. Do, do you think it will take a couple of cycles of the program to run through until, like, you've obviously, like, had enough athletes go through it and go through those adaptations for them to everyone, like, fully buy into that that sort of system? I don't think so. Like, athlete doesn't generally have a say in what happens. You do you do what your coach has said. I was always super interested, like, when we spoke with Emma Dyke, who's New Zealand team, double double Olympics or triple? Yeah, the double Olympics. Two, two Olympics in the, in the women's eight. I was like, how are they? So how are they doing? Like, how are New Zealand like being competitive with a country that has maybe five million people in it or something, five ten million mm. people? You know, it's like so much more than the UK. And she, you know, like, so the only really conclusion we came to is that it, it was exactly that. It, like individuals are looked at more. The training is varied. She said there are potentially some sessions where the younger girls, she sort of came into the team at twenty, as a third session would do a sixty minute bike. And the, the women that have been there a really long time could do up to four hours on the bike. Mm. And she would say, like, I feel really bad. You're having to sit here and do four hours. I'm only doing an hour. And they're like, don't feel bad because when you get older, you'll be like this because your body doesn't have the adaptation and you yeah. don't need to do this. And like, and like, for me, I think it looks like that's what they're doing differently. But then yeah. if you don't have the numbers, I mean, we'll get on with you, obviously, with who you coach. Like, you don't have a huge roam program. You don't have hundreds of people. You don't get to, like you said, put someone through the main grinder and then replace them the next day with with someone else. But. Yeah, and I, th I think I think I think a lot of sport is moving that way. Mm. You know, and I think it's important that athletes do have a voice. And I think you know the days of, you know, you just turn up and you you just do as you're told are slowly starting to die out. That old school mentality. Um, and I think looking back, it's always quite nice. Like, oh yeah, those were the good old days. Like mm. we're hard. But I think actually, you know, could your performances have been better? Potentially, you know, for yourself, you've got a PB outside the squad. Maybe because there was less pressure, you could relax off the sessions when you feel you needed to. And you didn't have that external pressure of always having to try and prove yourself. You could do the session that you needed at that period to get the most out of yourself. And I think, you know, I think Brendan Parcell got quite a bad rap when he when he sort of had to be the man who falls on the sword following mm -hmm. Tokyo. But, you know, you could see the vision that he wanted to implement into rowing, British rowing especially, was to move more away from the meat grinder and try and incorporate an athlete first vision. You know, my door is always open. Let's sit down and talk about the cricket. You know, it's very polar opposite to David Turner, the headmaster. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a very much more of a likable person. You can go to him and have a chat. You know, maybe was it too much? Potentially. I still think there should be a good barrier between, okay, performance director, athlete, because mm -hmm. you have to have those tough conversations. Mm -hmm. 
But I think, you know, it's a shame he was let go before he could really take hold of where he wanted the sport should go. And I think, you know, like with Louise, she's been part of it for a long time. And I think they were all sort of, they saw what was working and what wasn't working. And I think right now I'm not there every day, but I think they've managed to strike a good balance. It's not a lot different to when we were there, but I think they, they're starting to find that better balance between, you know, giving the athletes a little bit more freedom, especially on social media, making their own Instagram pages, mm. sharing training footage. You know, with us, no way. Yeah, yeah. Don't share ergo scores. Don't even show videos because the opposition might be able to time you going through boy lines. Like, yeah. Who cares at the end of the day? I remember like, having social media uh, training sessions with. Yeah. Karen yeah. Mike, so You're being told how to open a Twitter account when you've been on it for a year and a half, <laughs> yeah. and they're the ones making all the mistakes. Like, come yeah. on. I would not to put her down but I remember like it was not we were getting training from her and literally it was like a few weeks before at a world cup GB Rowing had tweeted like congratulations to to George Satch and Will Nash for making the A final <laughs> and you're just like guys yeah. <laughs> come on yeah uh, it's what you said really and again when we spoke to Vicky she said the same thing what your your greatest strength can also be your biggest weaknesses and when you when you have people who are that competitive there does come a point as a coach where you actually need to stop people from yeah. competing constantly you know trying to sit next to one and ergo and just trying to make sure that your score is better than his score and all that yeah. sort of stuff like there are definitely sessions where you need to kind of pull that out of it yeah um, again like Jack said uh, the year that he struggled the most was probably the year where things were kept up in the air for the longest and they felt like nothing was set and they were constantly competing against each other and compare that to the next year. So for him, that so that was like 2020 and then 2021 because they'd set the crews, like you said, and that was it and they were set, pressure was off. Finally, they could actually start rowing in the way that they wanted to. I mean, uh, was Zoe de Toledo said, she was like, realized when she was coxing, there was like two forms she could cox to make the boat go faster out or she would she could cox to get selected mm. and they were two like very different things and she realized I'm, I'm doing way too much i'm saying what i think the selectors will want to hear yeah. rather than actually making the boat go faster and it's those two kind of things yeah but um yeah, yeah. i think it's just having a bit more fun with it just relaxing switching off yeah, yeah. i think that's what we found in the four um the shallow four no, so the the one from 2017 with Will and Mo, and at that point we had Matt Roster in it, mm -hmm. and I think it was Poznan or something. Like we were there, we we're quite tense, and like oh, we're going to go on to the do our heat in this boat. You know, it hasn't been going very well up until this point. You know, we had Europeans, mm. we were in the B final, we almost lost to a German under 23 four. You know, now we're in this new combination. How's it going to go? And everyone's there, and like everyone sort of backs onto the start blocks. And so like getting on there, so and so's like this, so and that, and they start doing the roll call, and then Mo just lets out an almighty fart behind us. And I was like, what? <laughs> like this Olympic champion just like lets one loose, and then suddenly yeah. you just hear everyone just like giggling in the boat, and the opposition <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> anyway, you come forwards, and we had an absolute blinder. It was like a nice tailwind. It was like five forty something, and you know we were rocketing through there. And from that point onwards, we just tried having a bit of fun in it. Like before we got on the start line, we had to have some joke or something that made everyone laugh before we got onto the start blocks, just to like, just relax it a bit more, take the tension out of it. A hundred percent. Like what you said, like about athletes now being able to actually use social media, that definitely like adds to the overall fun that you're having and enjoyment from training, you know, making cool montages, compilations, being able to see like the progress that you've made, show some of the camaraderie. Or some of the stupid jokes that yeah. happened, like inevitably. Yeah. yeah. And that's a little bit why, you know, massive throwback now, why I started trying to do stuff on YouTube. Like, I don't even know when that would have been, like 2000 and something, like early in my senior career, I think. Before pre, pre Rio, I think. Yeah. Okay. And in my mind, I, I first started, I thought, you know, if the race doesn't go well, you get a lot of stick for it not going well. And I was like, I just want people to see actually how much hard work goes into that polished A final. Because at that point, it was only the A finals that made it onto the TV screen. Yeah, yeah. Like in a British boat, if you made the A final, you're expected to win gold. And if you don't, it's like, oh, they underperformed and Cracknell will get stuck into you on the commentary and it's like, <laughs> give it in. And then... Um, <laughs> You know, you go through all that. And then I just wanted to show what actually went into it. So it's yeah. like making the montages from the Sierra Nevadas, from the South Africa camps, to a little bit of what happens at the World Cups, to here before my Olymp my Henley final and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, there were limits to what I was allowed to share, but 
for me that was like the social media side of thing it, it gave me a little bit of a, a focus i liked editing my videos and it yeah. gave me a bit of time to switch off and i think that people enjoyed it just sort of seeing a different side to the squad absolutely i think now it's great as an old timer i sort of sit there and i i like watching them all going up Sil silveretta doing their ergos doing their own yeah. montages it's you know, much I like better following it looking at that camp when you're not there <laughs> yeah yeah i think all us old boys still want to go in like Sil silveretta go on a skiing trip or something when they're all in the uh on the running track staring out the windows on the running track oh do you see the sky one when they had like john 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 collins interviewed him and he's like he got a bit emotional and stuff. Yeah, and I, thought, I, feel, I feel you, mate. Like I'm, I've been that. I've been. <laughs> I've nearly cried up the mountain up there. My, yeah. my erg techers was too bad to make the cut for that one. <laughs> I was just always the like the chubby one walking around in the background. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, oh, what I was going to say about that. There was that one year where we we walked down into the village mm -hmm. and like in before the, that, like so the, at the, the, the training snow. center, uh, you're like very like split from anything else that's going on you're just there up the mountain training in Sierra Nevada, in the Sierra Nevada. Yeah. and then we walked down to like a little like where the ski lifts are where people actually because it's also like a ski resort yeah and we went down there it's like some shops and people that like messed me up because I was like oh this here's like normal people like enjoying their life and I'm just like destroying myself so, so <laughs> up there on the ergo like it was a tough camp yeah well, I remember that was the year we had loads of snow wasn't it yeah my first ever time up there and we were like just sledging down the side of the mountain on cardboard boxes <laughs> not on cardboard boxes we nicked trays <laughs> and we nicked trays i didn't go up there with you because the Did card machine not? ate my card so you oh, no, i didn't i didn't go all the way up no not uh. satch because they they like they like broke through the gate didn't they went up no. but we were we <laughs> <laughs> no they didn't no uh, <laughs> we were uh we <laughs> we we satch first nicked the trays we were doing on a little hill behind the kitchen Okay. And then some guys just run out like, ah, ah, ah. It's like oh shit, we've been caught. <laughs> just on the lunch train. <laughs> Do you remember the time of breakfast when they didn't let us in? Oh, we had like an early morning session and they decided they weren't going to let us in. Oh, sometimes. And, uh, Tom we James is just like, I've had enough. And like push past the guy and then everyone just starts walking in the back and helping themselves to everything. It was absolute mayhem. Yeah, no, it does happen. I thought you were going to say something about that triggered a memory from Fizu. When we, we'd finished racing and we we're all having some food. I think like obviously Fred was there and Mason and people like that. And I think someone just threw a bread roll. They like clocked Mason oh, in no. the head. It's like, oh, who did that? Threw it back. You didn't really see who did it. And then like, there'll be like an apple segment that came across the room and hit someone else. Like, oi, throw it back. And there was like a grape that came across. And I think at one point, I don't know if it was Mason or Scott or someone, but someone just picked up their tray and just threw it across the room. And then next <laughs> Sounds year, like a Brooks boy. Threw a tray. And then everyone was just throwing food at each other, having a huge food fight. This like just in the canteen after finishing racing. And then like the way the way H just came, was like, well, stop, stop, stop. And there's like blueberry pie like sliding down the wall. And someone there's like mayo because it's the same color as the paint trying to cover up. <laughs> And then Shep had to tidy it all up for us. He's like, okay, everyone just go. I'm going to sort this out. <laughs> like, here our savior. <laughs> I remember my first, two, 2009 was my first final trials when we were still in the Huzzlewinkle. And I didn't know anyone there. And I remember I kept seeing this guy walking around. And like one minute he's covered in Brooks kit. And then the next minute he's like got loads of Newcastle kit on. I was like, this guy's got a shitload of kit. I was like, and then, because I'd like see him. And then around the corner, like he'd come up. What the hell is going on? Like, I didn't know they were twins, obviously, and I didn't know them well enough. Like, you don't spend much time with them; you can tell them apart. But yeah. like, I was so confused <laughs> about this guy that had so much kit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's it. Uh, my pair's partner. I was with Webby. He tore his Achilles like six days before final trials, so I had to go. I had to go in the single. I told this story before. Came absolutely dead. Like I knew I was going to come dead last. I was yeah. never good in the single. Pull up on the landing stage. Hello, Tom Clark. You've been selected for random drugs testing. <laughs> I literally turned around to him and I was like whatever I'm taking it's not working is it yeah <laughs> that always like surprises me so much it's like the person that's come dead last you have to do boat weighing or drugs testing and it's I was like I'm pretty sure in kayaking they always select like the top five yeah I think they do normally have a podium I, I thought it was just random but did you yeah. do a lot of drugs tests in your time um I didn't do a lot I think my first ever one was the youth olympics in Sydney, Sydney yeah. and I, I did a couple from there but um, like boat waves and things like that, I think maybe three or four times. And that's why I was quite shocked again at Paris with Omar. You know, we we did our we did our heat, Saudi Arabia, got to weigh your boat. Uh, okay, a bit weird. Okay, weigh it. And then we did the final and he got knocked out. It's like, Saudi Arabia, we need to weigh your boat. I was like, 
we just raced twice on the same day and you're weighing our boat twice on the same day like what's going on <laughs> i was like my whole career was 15 years and i only weighed a boat three times and oh. this kid's had it twice at his first regatta in the same day <laughs> <laughs> just get it out we had it yeah probably a bit of sus yeah we had it in belarus we got a medal in the cox four and then uh the the weighing in was quite close to where GB was, so we'd we'd walked the boat round and everyone was kind of congratulating and stuff. And this big guy came out from the weighing tent and he was like, "Stop, everyone, stop! First we weigh the boat, then you celebrate." <laughs> so, okay, good point. Yeah, let's weigh it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So getting back to it, I guess and yeah, look, we were in Tokyo spare pair both times. Not quite the result you wanted out the back of Tokyo. Did you know you'd had enough? Were you thinking you might go again? What was the decision to, yeah, no, to step I think, away? So around the same sort of time as sort of starting to pick up the blood clot, I remember that sort of camp speaking to Pete Lambert. And I think up until that point, you were just sort of like checking the days. It was like, ah, oh, this many days until we go to the Olympics and then we can call time on this. Yeah, you know, It was all getting quite samey. It was all getting quite tiresome and you, know, you just wanted a bit of a change. Yeah, But I think actually, like even though that year was like, it was full of emotions of like you know always trying to prove yourself and always thinking you're doing enough to realistically never actually be given a shot um but then the biggest thing for me was actually jumping in the pair with morgan you know i had a lot of fun in the four but i don't think that's probably the one thing that i always think back to like what if i did carry on what would have been the potential for me and Morgan? Because hmm. the first time I got a taste of it was that uh, Pez Matrix before lockdown. So straight out of Olympic trials, went into the Matrix. You know, I was not not great, but I remember the last 500 meters of that thing, like Morgan was gone and I finished. And I was like, we were seeing like 128 in that last 500 sprint finish. Like this boat's got some gas if we had a bit of time together you know fast forward a year you were never given that opportunity and then uh we were in this four and then we got broken down into two pairs uh i think it was like a day or two days before the final olympic speed order um so i was put with morgan and uh ollie wilkes was put with harry and we sort of had two sessions that day to get to get to grips with it and then we had a pre-paddle the next day and then we did the time trial and we did the time trial and me and morgan did a 618 wow. and we're like all right that's rapid in a pair yeah and it's like our third session together in the pair our fourth yeah. session in the pair together and it was like it was it was easy you know in that last 500 i, I was thinking about this the other day i was like oh what if i actually gave it someone that last 500 because i was just sitting there and i could see we we're doing 132s in that last 500 and it was all morgan i was just sitting there up in the rate and he was giving it so i was like if i give it a little more you know maybe we can nip it under like 617 616 but 618 for me was i would take that any day of the week and then you know we we basically used tokyo as our pre-training camp for um henley and then we just did henley and unfortunately the dutch pulled out and the i think the under 23 the british boat the uh world champs they pulled out as well mm. um so there wasn't really anyone in there that was gonna test us that much and then we were like oh, maybe we'll try and break some some uh records here but it was always a headwind like oh, maybe not today <laughs> but that's the one thing like if i ca carried on you know how quick could that pair have gone if we actually had like a year or two years together yeah. absolutely you know what's world record time what's in the, in the men's pair uh, 607 or 609 yeah i think it's still held by the kiwis from london yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's it was yeah. in the heat or a semi i think that they i think it was semi-finals like, at london yeah yeah definitely not fine yeah, yeah but it's definitely hotting up like you know George and Ollie, Tom George and Ollie uh, when Griffiths uh, this year. I think they did like a six sixteen, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's that's going some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, six oh nine is ridiculous. Like no one else touched them. So, yeah, yeah. To be within that range is is ridiculous. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's always difficult. And for you, like for me, I think it got to the point where I was like, I know I'm, I know I'm not a bad rower. Like I got to the point where I was like. I feel like I'm just continuing to prove to other people, like, oh, I have to, I have to achieve this, so other people think I was a good rare. Mm. And it got to the point where it's just like, I think I'm, I'm happy with where I got to. I don't think I'm going anywhere further without blowing, blowing myself apart. So for you, was it like, was there like kind of some comfort in, in that, or did you struggle for a while to walk away from it? Especially because like both times that you tried for the Olympics, it wasn't, um, you weren't a million miles away. Like on mm. one time, you were a barrel away. So what was that like? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I think for me, I didn't really know if I wanted to finish rowing or not up until that point because I had such a good end to the season. I had so much fun in the fall with that, that small group of lads and then you know I had such a good time in the pair with Morgan. For me, that was probably the most fun I'd had in like a couple of years of my rowing was just, you know, just four lads having a good time. We had um, we had a really good coach as well, John, uh, from Radley. He was yeah. there looking after us as yeah, well, John yeah. Gearing. Um, and we just, you know, the five of us just had a really good time. And I think the, the hardest thing for me was that I was never sat down at British Rowing and I was never given a, this is why you haven't been selected. And I think for an athlete, if you don't have the data to support the decisions you're making, that's the hardest thing. Mm. You know, I, I tried talking to, I think at the time it was Steve Trapmore was the head coach. And I tried talking to Brendan and Louise and Shep and people like that. And I don't, I personally don't think I was ever given like, this is why you didn't get selected because you just weren't good enough. And if I had been shown that I just wasn't good enough, I think it's a lot better to accept. I went there, I did my best, you know hats off to the rest of them like you know how hard everyone's working and you're ne you're never there to say i'm better than this person mm -hmm. i deserve it more than that person because you know everyone commits their life to it but you just want a fair shot at when it when the cards fall you want to know like you know that nothing's been played around there like mm -hmm. you know, well, you want it to be legit and so when i stepped away that was probably the only thing but i think looking back you know i'm I think in the early days, like when I did eventually retire, I was still training twice a day and I was still looking what they're doing. Like, oh, I can still do 147s for my UT2s. You know, I'm squatting more than I was when I was in the team. I, I can come back and I can do this, I can do that. But I think now I just love sitting there and watching how they're all getting on. And every now and then I'll just slide into their DMs on Instagram and be like, it looks like you're all doing really well. And, you know, when they announced the team on Instagram, just seeing like someone like Ollie Wilkes finally actually being selected for the world champs in a boat that's going to do really fucking well. Like I was smiling. I was like, I'm really happy for these people. Mm. You know, you've seen them like even with Morgan, you know, he started rowing my little brother. They did home countries together or no, uh, GB versus France. He roasted my little brother in the pair and they won that together. So you've seen some of these athletes from there were little kids. Yeah. And now, you know, they got a real shot of doing some real damage next year at the Olympics. And, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm sitting there as the jealous old boy, like, oh, I could still outwork you. I can't, you know, I'm a couple of kilos heavy. I've lost a load of muscle and I sit on that machine and it breaks me in two every time. Yeah. I can't do any more than an hour a day. And my body wants to give out, let alone three sessions a day and still have energy. I had the, I had the same thing as you, like that moment well after I finished, to be then just have like pure joy for everyone else whereas before like this horrible like mind fuck in your head where you're like obviously i want everyone else to do well but i know if someone gets injured right now like i'm next in line mm. you know and like um in 2013 like ransley had a bad back i sat in that world's eight that that went and won worlds for like a couple sessions i was like i, I don't i don't wish any ill but there's like this voice in my head is like oh what if his back stays bad and you yeah. can be and you can't help it and it's horrible and then yeah and then you feel like shit because you're like oh, i don't want to wish i don't want to wish anything ill on my on my mates and then yeah like that moment when i finished i, I was just like could just be like purely happy for them and I was yeah like, that was i loved that yeah. yeah taking that that bit away from it which was was pretty good so then i guess yeah then finishing off obviously you, you then start doing your own thing I guess you've already already had a program for yourself coming back from the blood clot. Yeah. Was that something, I don't know what you did at uni, was that something you were always looking at doing or? No, uni was um, construction management. Okay. So I did engineering at college, construction management at uni, um, but always liked the programming side of things. And I think from the pro with the row elite side of things, it was, that was pretty much just an idea following Rio. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I realized that I had committed everything to the rio olympics and like you know everything i did was to go out there and try and win a medal and i was like oh, if i was in that pair i could have won a silver because so and so had never got this close to me and that i'd always beaten that crew and whatever but then i realized that actually that level of hyper focus can sometimes be detrimental mm -hmm. and actually some of the crews that were or some of the athletes that were performing well they were the ones that had figured out how to switch off when they needed to you know they'll go out with the lads on the weekend they'll have a couple of things to drink and you know make the most of their time off and they'll have a good social life outside of it whereas for me i was still living at home with my parents i was commuting in from london every day i was there to train i was there to perform and i i just think i needed something to sort of take the focus off myself for a while 
And that's pretty much where it came from was with the row elite was just, you know, it's still rowing, but it was being able to switch off from what was going on in my life and try and put that into helping and supporting other people. Yeah. yeah. And that just sort of naturally developed over the years. And that sort of, that is the reason where I am today with the Saudis. You know, I had, again, I, well, I guess I had another injury. I had an issue with my, my quad when we played football in Sierra Nevada. I would always be in defense. I think someone took a time lap once, time lapse, and everyone was running everywhere. And there was just me, like a one meter square, like figure of eight, just in front of the goal <laughs> in my defensive position. Never used to run, just used to use it as like a recovery session. But this one time I decided to run after an SSC coach to tackle him, tore my quad. Oh, was like, ah, oh, that was so painful. And so I still had that for the British indoors. And so I got a booth, had a row elite stand there, I was just chatting to people. And then a guy called Mohad Rari came up asked if I could write my training program, what, did that. What year was that? That was probably 2018, okay. 17, 18, something like that. Uh, so I started writing his training program. He was, I think he was just out of Cambridge or just left Cambridge, but he had aspirations of trying to be a national team athlete, but the Saudis didn't have a national federation at that point, but he'd wanted to get fit and strong. So I wrote his program for about three months. And then... Um, couple of days before christmas he wanted to have a meeting he sat me down was like look i'm i'm the president of the rowing federation would you mind writing the program for the other three athletes we have in the country uh, and i was like yeah sure like let's do it and that sort of sort of held that position for a couple of years and then that just naturally moved into where i am now so you've actually been involved with the saudis for for quite a few years now it's not a, a recent thing yeah yes i mean in the early days we only had maybe four or five athletes um and you know the federation is only five years old so wow. it's it's all incredibly new um you know even the compound that we train out of the security guards are on rotations and you've got to educate them what rowing is every time you want to try and get in because you say i'm with saudi tushdeev and they're like what's tushdeev and you get the instagram count out it's like it's rowing they're like oh on the water it's like yeah on the moya let's go yeah and they finally let you in um but i in the early days you know bill barry was the head coach uh, he was looking after people like Hussein, who finally got to go to the Tokyo Olympics in the end. Um, but I was there more as sort of like a mentor. I could talk to them if they need it. If they're in the country, I'll come and support Bill and yeah. just give them a little word of advice to look at them on the water. Uh, and then, you know, do most of their programming, help them out a little bit, tell them how to pace ergo strategy, stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed it because for me, that was again, me trying to do something that you know you're not going to row forever mm. what do i want to do at the time i was thinking more about row elite i want to push that and then you know this naturally progressed into okay well, outside of this once i retire from british rowing this could be a potential future for me mm -hmm. so how many athletes do you have now by comparison um so for this camp that we're hoping they arrive on saturday we'll have nine athletes that's like our, our nine senior athletes and we have um there'll be one more back home or two more back home training um, ready for the coastals and the masters. Outside of that, we maybe have maybe six junior athletes and maybe a handful of under 23s. Um, but you know, a lot of them have only been rowing for on the water. I was actually quite surprised myself. I've been rowing for longer, but I actually realized that, you know, most of the guys that we're now trying to take to the Asian games, they were novice athletes who I started writing land-based programs for on our pre-Tokyo training camp in, in Gavarati. Nice. So that's when they started training on the land, but we had no water access. So they trained on the Ergo for six months until our current CEO, Yusuf, uh, managed to find a villa in a holiday resort that had access to some water. And we put a fleet of boats in there that Mo had bought as the previous president. Yeah. And then basically from about a year now, they've had access to a water. So most of them have been rowing on the water a year and in total, maybe two years of rowing experience. Okay. So because they started on the yoga for a while, potentially that allowed them not to like bet in some like bad habits and allowed the technique to be better on the water. Cause they already yeah. like kind of had a preconceived idea of like what muscles to use, how to move their body. They just needed to learn how to operate the handle and the oar itself. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, it was, it was quite useful because we selected all of them off the back of the first national indoors we held, I think it was in Jeddah or Riyadh. And we basically just picked the top 10 from men and women and juniors. And those are the ones that we offered a program to. And, you know, it, indoor rowing is boring at the best of times, but these, you know, after six months of only training on land, you're left with these athletes that are still completing every single session that you send them on a spreadsheet. 
you know, you know they're serious. You yeah. know they actually want to do this for a passion. Yeah. And now those lot who are coming on Saturday, pretty much every single member of that team were the ones that did the full six months. And I was a complete nerd after retiring from the British squad. I had nothing better to do. So I was just sat in my flat, data crunching all day. And I can, if I have my spreadsheets, I can tell you how many sessions they completed, their total mileage, how their average splits progressed. And every single one of them had like 88, 89% completion over that full six month period that's incredible yes yeah, so they were super committed that's a that's a good test give it put athletes on the ego for, for a long period of time see if they actually want to row like for the first six months of my rowing career i i, I didn't go outside on the water because one for the first i started in january so the water was frozen until basically like april or may time mm -hmm. and then when we did get out the priority was the athletes who already knew how to row and then they had to like source us into boats etc so i didn't actually go out on the water until like may that year yeah just crazy so i only knew like air growing and i really liked it yeah if you <laughs> start <laughs> there's this amazing thing called rowing on the water like, that's <laughs> yeah better. if you start by enjoying the egg then you're definitely going to enjoy water rowing yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah. when uh when did you first go out there and how much time do you spend out there now so I first touched foot in September last year. Okay. So this time last year in August, we managed to um, organize their first ever training camp. And so we brought them over here for five weeks. We trained out of Walton and we went to Dorney and we did some 2K ergos and water stuff. Uh, and then September was when I officially started out in Saudi. And now I'm out there full time. So yeah. I think, well, for some reasons or another, I'm, I don't come in the country for more than 90 days a year. But... I sort of, I think I, it's quite hard to hit that anyway, mm. when, you know, you, you're the PD and you're the head coach, you're always tied up doing something, whether it's yeah. sort of trying to org organize training camps, organize competitions, tracking athlete progression, writing the program, you're coaching every day as well, whilst trying to go to all the, the coaches conferences and boat orders and all the logistical stuff. Yeah. It does take up a lot of time, but you know, it's. It's been good fun so far. Pretty stressful, but yeah, you know, pretty fun at the same time. Different being on the other side of it from from being an athlete, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, massively different. And like, part of me is still thinking this. This is probably more realistic of what it is. I mean, yeah, you know, even in Paris, we were a team of three. We had one athlete. Mm. It was me, and then Lama, our team manager, and then you see British rowing turn up. They had their own coach. They had like thirty, forty athletes. You had the PD, and then. You had the head coach and every single crew had their own coach and you could see everything as like a well-oiled machine. And it's like, oh, that's what I remember things being like. And then you're there, you're like, okay, I'm the boatman. I'm like helping with the team manager. I'm the head coach. I'm the PD. I'm the logistics. I'm this, I'm that. And you're like, you're wearing all the hats. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a great learning experience. Definitely. Yeah. Plus you've got that experience from coming from the well-oiled machine. And also you can have so, so much of a bigger impact on a system that's, I mean, it did, yeah. was that for you like the, from getting involved and going full time, it's like this is a real challenge. We're really starting from from basic. Yeah, yeah. Like it, you are literally starting from ground zero. And I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, I am so used to the British rowing way of things, mm. and you have to completely realign your expectations and your goals. You need to be a lot more realistic, and you can't expect to walk into a new culture, into a new setup, and try and impose what you're used to because things just work differently. Mm -hmm. And it maybe took me a couple of months to figure that out, but I think I'm slowly getting the hang of it. And, you know, you have to talk to people in a certain way. There are certain ways of getting stuff done that mm -hmm. is just not what you do in the UK, but in Saudi, that's, that's how it is done. You know, there's different rules, different procedures, different ways of life, you know, different climate, you know, no yeah. one understands the sport. So not only are you trying to educate the athletes, you're trying to educate the federation and the staff supporting you, you're trying to educate the public, the government, you know, there's there's a lot of money in the country, but there's no money in sport because yeah. no one knows what it is. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're building slowly. So you have to do that and also like jump through all the hoops and like little steps up the ladder in order to like convince people of like why you want to implement certain ideas and everything. But hopefully yeah. one day you get to look back on it and, you know, see a team of 30, 40 athletes and be like, I, I, was, I was here when, when it was just five of us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had the big impact. I remember when I first saw on social media, you're out there, I was like, what the hell? What the hell is he doing out? It's so, like, how is he got? Why would you even go out? Or why would you go? Out? And then so it was, there was like a vi it was like a video. It was like a couple boats and people rigging. And then it like pans around and it's like a beach and palm trees and like you and Bill Barry. And I was like, okay that makes sense that makes sense like, okay i can see i can see why he's out there now like yeah. sunny all year round yeah 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 or would you like to like coach 
in the UK, and yeah. be like on your bike in the pissing rain. Yeah, but it, it, yeah, I mean, it is different. It is that it's completely different. I think when you come back here, the one thing you you realize you miss the most is you can have nice long walks outside and it's that perfect temperature where you're just in a t-shirt you're not sweating but you're not cold you can go for a nice you can walk your dogs yeah in saudi past eight o'clock no one leaves their homes you know we boat at 6 a.m and after eight o'clock it's 38 degrees plus and so you're just indoors and especially now with the humidity we have our juniors and development squads they're supposed to start training at 5 p.m but we push that back to 5 30 because that's when it starts dipping below 40. But wow. by that point, you got jet skis and pleasure boats and people swimming right outside the villa. So the main point of the coach there is just sort of like safety lifeguard, just quartering them through yeah. into the main lake that's 1,900 meters long, just so they're safe. And then you can start your session. I yeah. think it was you that said that like when you asked for a training center and then you got given a, a marble floored villa. Yeah. <laughs> like to explain like the difference between what people think know about the sport. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean... Uh, <laughs> As a federation, we have, at our current high performance center, we have seven boats. I think we've got one Swift, one Wintech, we've got a couple of Felipe's, and we've got two coastal singles. And then we don't have enough oars to fill all those boats. I think we're sort of one or two sets short. Really? So when that happens, we'll sort of try and do some coastal sprint stuff. So we'll take two juniors in the coaching launch to one of the local beaches, and then we'll just rotate in one boat and just get some in that time. Um, but we've got another center uh, in Jebel on, on the Gulf Coast, which is perfect for coastal stuff. Um, and we took Chris and Faye, Chris Perry and Faye on a, a tour of Jeddah. And then we found that actually the East Coast was a lot better. Gulf Coast, a bit rougher, more more sea vibes. So we're actually going to hold our first ever coastal sprint championships. On the Gulf Coast? Uh, in November on the Gulf Coast, yeah, along in, uh, in Jebel. Awesome. So that's going to be our first ever water national championships, but it'll be a, a sprint coastal event. That looks fun. I haven't had any involvement in it, but I um, I did home countries this year with Wales. I coached with, um, and Wales have been pretty hot on their coastal stuff for the last couple of years, and yeah. it, it sounds really fun. It sounds yeah. a lot more like what gets lost in rowing these days. Yeah, and it's surprisingly technical. Yeah. I think we uh, we sent a small squad to Thailand this year um, for the Asian Coastal Championships. And our biggest thing was just trying to get in the boat and off. And I think the amount of data we got from the coaches conference is like this many seconds from where you pop up when you pass the stern of the boat to actually being in it, taking your first stroke. And I think it's like four seconds or something from sprinting down, passing the boat, getting in and rowing. It's that quick and just having that down where like step it in rotate sit on your seat grab your hands take it off but then not only have you done that right that's one box ticked you're off then you got waves crashing over your bows and you're having to go around these boy lines and sprint back and then get out and run across the beach four seconds that's incredible and you gotta strap your shoes on that as well yeah yeah it's, yeah it's i mean crazy. you're allowed two people holding your boat and you can yeah. jump in that way but you know i think when we were doing we're, st we're still making it up as we go along i've never done coastal sprint stuff before so you know, I'm just reading as much as I can and YouTube videos and coaching conferences. Yeah. And, you know, for, for us, there is a big lack of water in Saudi Arabia. Like yeah, yeah. our lake is fed by the Red Sea. It's 1900 meters long. That's where we do the majority of our classic racing. And in Jebel, we still do classic rowing, but it, it's on the seafront. So when it gets a bit choppy, you're, you're rowing on the sea in a classic yeah. boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we do have those two and we are definitely looking to branch out into classic and coastal, but then also pushing the indoor scene as well because that's where a lot of our athletes have come from yeah do you have to adjust to training in any way for like um different seasons of the year because I, I heard from people that live in dubai that pretty much between may and september you just go to europe it's way too hot to exist in that time so i yeah. guess we've just come out of that, that period of training is it is it easier to train in the winter would you say it's a bit easy i mean the, the temperature's better but then you've got shorter days Oh, and yeah. so a lot of my athletes have full-time jobs or they're in full-time education and so sort of september october november december time i think you're probably looking at it it starts getting light around 6 45 and so that's when you're trying to bow trying to get out just mm -hmm. as the sun rises because the coast carb won't let you out if it's still dark mm -hmm. so as soon as the sun starts to come you're pushing up and you're going but they have to be in their car leaving at eight o'clock. For their job, yeah. Yeah, so you sort of program in a classic 16K or something, 8K in, you see the athletes are already heading home. You're like, hey, and where are you going? It's like, oh, I need to go to work. Like, what? 
<laughs> you've only been on the water 40 minutes like coach i can't help it like i need a job yeah and so it's it's a lot better condition wise you know you're probably looking at an average temperature of 25 degrees to 28 degrees on a day you know Riyadh's probably the coldest and it, it just dips below 20 Ooh. um but then you go through ramadan and that's obviously a big thing and you know you're you're trying to you're trying to prepare for the world cup season which mm. happens straight after ramadan yeah and you've got this month of athletes who are dehydrated with no energy and so you're trying to figure out okay how am i going to give these athletes enough training stimulus to hold on to the good work we've just done but then try and get them prepared for the racing season it, it that was quite a challenging sort of balancing act but i think we did quite well yeah and then as soon as you come out of that into the racing season it starts getting summer and it starts getting incredibly hot yeah and so for example in Riyadh you know you can walk the streets at three o'clock in the morning and it'd be 42 degrees and then you know in Jeddah at the moment they've got a sandstorm and I was talking to Sheila looking after the athletes out there and she said it was okay two days ago but the air quality at the moment is really bad and you could actually feel like you were breathing in sand particles so then we made the decision like there's no training the next day because it's going to get even worse yeah. so you know not only is it really hot not only is it super humid but sometimes you get sandstorms and that that just makes it um, impossible to row as well so there's a lot of different factors you have to weigh in not only the temperature but also people's full-time job and employments and you know how do you fit the load in because you know what the opposition are doing mm. absolutely and you're already a new country trying to break into this new sport you know first we want to be competitive in asia then we'll look to be competitive on the world scene but even the best athletes in asia are training full-time yeah, yeah and we're trying to fit two sessions in a day if possible around our full-time employment and it's challenging those are some of the challenges that you forget like training in a country like uk that other other countries have to deal with ramadan where a majority of your athletes are presumably muslim and then also the scorching the heat yeah things like sun storms full-time jobs just like taking the sport back here years and years ago yeah no. How would you how would you find how do you find the language barrier as well? Like being over there, it's like obviously completely different alphabet, same numbers there. Uh the numbers are different. Are they? Yeah. I thought I thought we had Arabic numbers here. No, no. So, so like one is one, two is like a reverse seven, three is a reverse seven with three lines on it, a four is in like a backwards E, I think. A five is a zero, a six is a seven. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think a seven is like a V, an eight is a an A without the line. A nine is a nine, and then a, a zero is a dot. So the numbers are all slightly different, but wow. the language barrier for me, a lot of them speak good English. And that those that can't, the guys in the team will translate for me. Mm -hmm. And you sort of pick up little bits here and there. Are you learning you, Duolingo? Not Duolingo. Duolingo actually sucks for Arabic. Okay. It just gives you lots of like noises, and after a while, you get used to the noise and you press that for the letter, but it doesn't yeah. actually teach you sentences or useful yeah. words. It just tells you letters. It's like vocab, isn't it? Yes. But the athletes are always quite good. They always give me like a new word each week to try and understand. And, you know, for me, I always just say quayas, which is good. <laughs> you're doing good. You're doing good. And then moya for water and halas for finish and. You know, just little bits and pieces along the way. Yeah, to up. go on the water. Yeah, yalla. Yeah. <laughs> yalla is like faster. Go, 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 yeah, go. Yalla, yalla, yalla. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's great. Well, I've coached at, um, at Oxford College. I've had an athlete uh, who did Ramadan, and like, absolutely, like, hats off to her. So on training camp one year. Yeah, like, absolutely, like, unbelievable. Like, as a heavyweight athlete, at all throughout my career, like, watching lightweights do that sort of training and not eat and it's like there's, there's no way i'm in this sport if yeah. i can't finish my session and just eat whatever the hell i want <laughs> gorge <laughs> yeah no, like that is the that is rowing like that's the point of it yeah so hats off for that um, yeah yeah i mean we're speaking with tim tim foster he said you know when he went out and coached in, in with a swiss team he was like gold standard gold standard gold standard this we've got to be on the gold standard and he was like i sort of totally forgot that they were like super happy to like make make competitions make b final or make a finals things like that and mm. he was like oh, it took him a while to be like this is a different system and like there are different goals and it's easy to forget like you said being in the british system is gold or nothing yeah and you forget that you know when you're at school or under 23s you know can i make the a final like you know there are diff there are different levels to to achieve those kind of things so I, it's uh, interesting as someone like comes obviously like from the european system of racing and like knowing the competitions and the countries and you know, you turn up to Europeans, you know who's going to be there. It's going to be Poland, Germany, Netherlands, France, Italy, etc. Like, 
how do you find Asian games and how would you compare like the Asian rowing to to like European rowing and who are some of the big players over there? Yes, I think we went to the Asian Championships in December and for us that was just we need to see where we rank. Like none of our athletes have a race before. I mean, we had Hussein who just come back from the Olympics. We had Sultan who had been training for about three or four years. He'd done an under 23, fresh out of lockdown. And we had a caraman who'd been on the scene for about three or four years as well. So we had maybe three athletes that had done some form of competition in the past, but no one else in the team had ever raced before in their lives. And we're like, we need to start trying to get some race experience and we need to figure out actually how fast is the rest of Asia and what's our gap you know, doing the old gap analysis, what percentages should we set our, our gold standard for? It's not like, you know, we don't use, you know, world record time, hit 100%, you're doing well. It's like, okay, how far off world record time is Asia? And then how far off that time do we need to be to be competitive? Mm-hmm. Um, you have to set midterm goals. Yeah, yeah midterm and just trying to be realistic with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for us, I mean, like the Kazakhstans, Iran, uh, they're all, and Uzbekistan, they're all, good rowing nations at this level um especially the iranian women like they're on fire and you had the lady who did really well in yeah, tokyo yeah. and she went to the asian championships i think came back with three medals most of them in the heavy women's events wow yeah and like you know there are some good some good teams out there and you've seen the training they're doing they're all working hard and you know you turn up and you do see the chinas and the hong kongs and the people like that who are pretty well drilled but then you see people like afghanistan like turning up and their boats literally has like looks like it's got bullet holes in the side of it and it's like someone's just pulled it out of the back of a skip and that's what they're going racing in wow but uh that was a weird one in their semi-final something happened i was like yes we're beating them we're beating them and they came off the water and it turned out that i think the bow man had said something that offended the three man and the three man just stopped rowing 200 meters before the finish line just threw his handles away and started screaming at the bow man <sighs> And they came in and had a huge argument and then the next day put it to bed and won the race. But it's just like a different side of the sport that you don't see. You normally, you normally just in, keep in, going. In Asia, there's like a much more of a cultural thing of offense, isn't it? And yeah. uh, the difference between elders and... Yeah, like, lots of respect. Yeah, yeah. that thing is, is a bit different, yeah. Yeah, but now we're moving into the Asian Games again. You know, we have a rough idea of where we stand and, you know, we've pushed everything on 2% this year to try and make sure that when we go to the Asian Games, we're, we're going for it and... You know, for me, I work for the Olympic Commission, so they're the ones that get the final say on who goes. We just nominate the crews who we mm-hmm. think have done enough, and mm-hmm. they decide who goes. And so that was another a big thing this year, was making sure that we we're doing enough testing through the year to start building a profile for each athlete so we had enough data and evidence to push forward. Because up until then, we had nothing. You know, we had no data outside of a 2K ergo test. So, you know, luckily we got a bit of funding and we went to Gavarati a few times. They did some 2K testing there. We came to the UK in June when we saw you guys and yeah. we did lots of racing there and we learned from all of that. So all those little things we were doing, we were compiling data and profiles for each athlete. Yeah. And that's got us to this point where we've got three crews that have been selected to race. We've got two boats that are going to be the spares coming with us. That'll be in China for the Asian Games. We have two my, my boats they're going to south africa to get more experience at the masters we've got a mixed double going to the world coastals and then we just select we had a selection meeting last night um for the juniors to see who can go to uzbekistan for the asian championships and so we'll probably have uh, three or four crews racing out there in the end of october as well so, so they still that's like world rowing events Asian so games, they're so. they're Asian rowing events, okay. Um, but Asian rowing, it, it's a bit difficult to figure out what's going on. Yeah. A lot of things are very last minute. Their website used to be like working, and now it's no more. You try and go on World Rowing to find scores and stuff, and they're just nowhere to be seen. It'd oh. be nice if World Rowing like had that data on there, like they do with yeah. the European World Rowing yeah, stuff. But it's be. not there. But you're still overseen by the International Olympic Committee. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. When you go to the Olympics. Oh, for for those slots, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I think that will come in like in the in the next few years, especially like seeing you've got a squad of like let about twenty athletes like across like all the disciplines like juniors under twenty three, and and senior, and then got them running in full swing. There's a lot of operation going on, on yeah, like, a lot of competing, a lot of like different places. Like it must be must be difficult trying to organize all of this, but also what a great opportunity to like try something new right if you're building an mm. entire new squad from scratch you know looking at data looking at building athlete profiles like you get to choose what metrics you want to track and yep. what you want to implement like do you something like britain can't do isn't it 
you know, yeah, yeah. when you're winning, don't change anything. Yeah. But now yeah. you've got like an open sort of field of play. What are some of the things that, for example, you'd like to implement that you maybe like come like discover when you were doing your row elite stuff or like drawing on your experiences from like the British rowing team? Yeah, I think, well, a big thing for me is just getting rid of junk mileage. I think <laughs> you can't you know, do that in 42 degrees. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that comes to mind. Like, if you're getting on the water and it says three by 2K, why would I do that in a 20K session? You know, I don't need a, a 4K warm up or a 6K warm up and then a 4K warm down in between. You know, just go out there, get as much out of those 2Ks as you can, come off the water. Mm. You know, to me, that's just a bit of junk mileage just there to hit a total. So I think just being more efficient in the way you're writing it. I think it's, it's, you know, it's fairly similar to, again, I talk about Tomo, but when he said he went to China, the biggest thing he learned was that every single coach had an interpreter. And so he would sit there and just give them this huge dialogue of this is what I want you to do. And then the interpreter would just dumb it down and mm. give it to them in a line. And he learned that actually just get to the point and just say yeah. this, say that, get rid of the junk, the waffle. And I thought I've sort of taken that, not how I just sort of talk to the athletes, but the programs that we write and our yeah. sort of philosophy on it is just get rid of all the junk. Like if you're going out there to do this, just do it, get it done. I love that. And that's what we do. Like we go out there, if we've got a peace session, we'll go out there, okay, everyone meet at the top of the lake, do a good warm up. we'll meet there, we'll get them all together in a pack mentality. Okay, if it's a couple minute on, minute off, whatever, two minute pieces, eight minute pieces, we'll just get them all in one line, men and women. You know, the women won't do the full course distance because maybe a lightweight double will row through them and you know, you stop everyone early because they're about to crash into the bank, but the, the sky, they still have 100 meters to go. Yeah. But you sort of you just do the staggered starts and you keep staggering the starts until they all finish mm -hmm. level. And you just sort of, you know, you, you make those allowances because, you know, we need to get race experience. And I think the more competitive yeah. we can get in the smallest time frame we have will give us the, the best results. Well, this is the thing with a limited amount of like time for sessions and training and selection and all, all that sort of thing. It sounds like you could be doing something similar to Brooks where like every, the efficiency of every session like is so maximized like you really tend to like respect all the available mileage that you do have and like it's yep. what you do in that time because like if your athletes have full-time jobs and for half the day you can't even go outside or barely can go outside like what do you do then so yeah, yeah and the 200 it doesn't matter how much you love do or don't love the GB system a 200k a week thing doesn't work if your athletes have jobs it's yeah. just you can't do it so yeah. you're gonna have to find a different way yeah we, we we have we do try it every now and then um and then i mean we try and get exemptions as well but you're only allowed a certain amount of exemptions in a year mm. and again it's depending on if you work for a government entity or a, a private body you know the private body doesn't have to give you the time off we can mm. send them an exemption there to say we need this guy to come on a two-week training camp can you let him go they can say nah mm. and so you can't take that athlete on camp with you but if it's a government person like yeah sure off they go and, and it's fine mm. But at the same time, with some students, they have issues with their deans. And technically, the deans should let them go. But then they're always trying to make that happy. But like, well, if you do go, we're going to affect your marks and your grades. And you're like, oh, I don't know. So you're always treading that fine line. But we have one guy at the moment who's who's training really hard. He works for Aramco. You know, he is someone that will do every single thing that you ask of him. And he has a full-time job. He has a wife and kids every morning. Like you probably look at his Instagram, he'll be up at 4.30 a.m. walking to the sea, he's in Jabal. He'll go out, do that 16K in 83% humidity, which is crazy hot. He'll get it done, he'll come in, shower, he'll go to work, his lunch break, he'll do a bike, he'll go back to work. Before he goes home and see the kids, he'll do a weight session. And he just does that on repeat every day and somehow keeps going. Shout out to him. Yeah. That is some dedication. Yeah. Perseverance. I'm saying yeah. you get better, you just keep going. You just keep going. Yeah. Like Colin said it in a funny way. He was like, I just kept going and like looking behind me. And then I got to a certain point when there was, there's no one in front of me anymore. Yeah. So I just kept going. Like, yeah. That's also, half of it. Also 83% humidity. Like, how do you breathe? <laughs> well, that was, that was the thing. He actually messaged me last week and said, what do you think? Like, it's just, it is hard to breathe. And so then we started adjusting the mileage bringing the mileage down definitely adjusting the intensity mm. and just sort of prioritizing the land side of things and yeah. I, you know i had a at a breakfast at dorney court with bill barry the other day and we spoke about humidity and stuff like that and even things like that because the federation is so new we don't have any real policies you know i wrote the selection policy for them back in october and that got approved a couple like a week ago and we started using implementing that for the junior selection yeah but then I was talking to Sheila when she was talking about the air quality. And I was like, okay, I'm having one discussion about humidity. I'm having another discussion about the air quality. 
we need some sort of policy in here that you know what happens when it hits this temperature what is the protocol what happens when it hits this humidity you know this air quality yeah, what yeah. what are our procedures you know to maximize our our training load whilst looking after the the health of the athletes it's absolutely the hardest part that first few years that you're in now like mm -hmm. it is the hardest part like because without results you can't interest investors or you know promoters like once you can get those first few results start and get some medals and stuff all of a sudden you get the ball rolling but like this bit yeah. is like the grind yeah i mean we're, i think we're incredibly lucky i think you know myself aside i think so everyone behind the scenes is just so passionate about it you know our, our new president is hussein's father Ali and you know he's he's been incredible from sort of keeping the federation alive of injecting it with with capital and enthusiasm and you know he created the board and everyone in that board brings something to the sport we have a great CEO Yusuf who you know he was the chief demission at the last Asian Games he's very like cued in he's our age he loves sort of getting down there and you know he's been offered positions with other federations like no i'm like i'm creating something here and so yeah. he's a hundred percent in there and you know he found us the federation he found us the high performance center he's now trying to get more boats in there we found some money so we're going to buy some secondhand boats off the back of the asian games and get them shipped in mm -hmm. you know we got more athletes but we lack the infrastructure and outside of that you know everyone behind the scenes we got three other four other coaches spread between Jeddah and jabail and they're all starting to work day and night sort of try and get things going you know it, it is is a, a nine well i say nine till five it's a it's a 24-hour job out there at the moment even yeah. more so than here it's awesome i mean it's awesome for rowing like like the reason why we all did rowing to the level we did because we loved it we had like a love for a sport i love the sport i love a lot of things about the sport that make it different from it um it was something that i enjoyed from coaching is when you get to see an athlete fall in love with the sport yeah and be like i had a hand in that um and like part of the reason of doing this is like to hopefully like bring the sport of rowing to a wider audience or at least get knowledge out to other rowers that otherwise they wouldn't have, have access to. Um, so it's awesome. Like, I mean, you must feel the same way about doing that, but especially for a new country, bring it to a new country, like getting rowing involved, but also like, you know, in terms of on the world stage, you don't always want to watch the same country win everything. And like, mm. I would love to see more competition. I would love to see more countries get involved. And like, hopefully, like this is one of the ways that that's going to happen. Yeah, and I mean, I'd, I'd love to get Saudi on that podium sometime at the Asian Champs or the Asian Games. For me, that would be incredible. That'd be like, okay, job done. Yeah. Now, now we now we can just leave it ticking. It's a world oil machine. But I think the biggest thing as well is just sort of for me coming from here. All you see is what media portrays saudi arabia to be mm. and it's this whole human rights things people doing this people doing that you go out there it, it, it's completely different you know i feel safer in saudi than i do walking the streets of london you know there's no alcohol there's still drugs and stuff but it, it's not there there's mm. a huge crackdown with it like i think they've in the last couple of weeks alone they've arrested like 15 20 000 people who have all been linked to drugs but because there's no alcohol there are no idiots on the street yeah you know your nightlife is everyone meeting for a social coffee in the coffee shop you go to Jeddah old town and you're walking through these super historic like small alleyways and you go past and there's all these old guys just having a shisha and just sort of chilling out and you walk past families their kids are just all sat around in a circle having their food on the street yeah and then you go past coffee shops everyone's just quietly there sipping there there's no like obnoxious music blaring at you there's no airplanes flying over there's no one being sick on the floor next to you yeah. you know I, I brought imogen out with me back in Fe uh, february and you know once she got over that uncomfortableness of like oh what am i allowed to wear yeah you know, we bought her some of just these robes and by the end of it we were going on a shopping spree she loved them so much she wanted them that color this color that pattern was putting it on and wear whatever you want underneath it. it's completely fine yeah. And once she got over that, she was like, actually, I feel like I feel really at ease here. And it's yeah. just a nice, chill place. And it's that whole respect culture. Yeah. Everyone respects the elders. Everyone looks after each other. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and they respect the law as well, because like, yeah. it's, it's, it's for the common good. Yeah. Community values. Yeah. A country uh, is not its people. Like, there's two very different things. You know, I sort of think about America, you know, like you said, you read the paper like government and it's absolutely insane. But the people are not its government. Um, yeah. it's two different things and that's awesome to hear I was going to say yeah what it, what is it like day to day life I yeah mean, if you're coaching at either end you've got the middle of the day like what are you doing try and get some of your own training in crunching the numbers 
Yeah, well, unfortunately, Dura is where we're based at the moment, Dura Alarus, but that is literally 45 minutes outside of Jeddah. And so if we don't have a Federation car, you're just you're in the villa day and night. And I, I live at the villa and I do all my work at the villa. So my, my typical day, I go around five o'clock, get some like admin done, and then the athletes will start arriving around 5.30. Mm -hmm. So for them, they've got to be up at like four because they need to get the 4.30 bus from Jeddah to Dura to get there for 5.30. Mm -hmm. We'll boat at six. We'll normally be done by 7.30, 8. They'll go off to work. I'll have like breakfast and then maybe have like an hour just nap. And then I'd wake up and start work again at sort of 10 o'clock. And I'd do that through to two. I have a lunch break. That's where I normally fit my ergo in, try and fit an hour in or something. And then I'd work again from three till five. And then the juniors will arrive and we'll take the juniors out for a paddle from anywhere from like five till, you know, after we sit down, they love sitting and talking about rowing and, mm -hmm. you know, looking at rowing footage and stuff like that. So awesome. by the time they've left, it's getting on to like seven, half seven. And then they're finally back on the bus heading back into Jeddah. And so by eight o'clock, you're having your food. But then you sort of sit at the kitchen table, which is my office as well. So I just sort of sit there. I'll probably watch YouTube whilst eating my dinner. And then I'm like, blub, blub. Oh, I had an email. I'll answer that email. And then by the time you know it, it's 10, 11 o'clock at night. You've just been doing admin again. So you're like, oh, I should probably go to bed. Yeah. You go to bed for a couple of hours, wake up and do it all over again. But, you know, from that angle, it can be quite tough. But then, you know, once you have a car, you can go in and out of Jeddah and it's mm. nice. And you go on the training camps and that's also nice. But, uh, culturally as well you know in Dura you can pretty much do whatever you want there are women in bikinis there's men doing whatever men want to do there's groups of men and women you know it's not people completely covered up and you know you can't no skin's allowed to see the sun it's it's very relaxed around there and even in shopping malls you know it depends what area of the country you are if you're on the east coast near Jabal you know men aren't allowed in shopping malls if you're if you're showing off too much leg you can't wear shorts you have to wear long trousers and most of them wear the phobes which are the white the white gowns mm -hmm. you know 90 percent of the men will wear those day in day out that is that is what they wear all the time but in Jeddah, it's a bit more relaxed you can go into like the red sea mall and mall of arabia you can you know wear shorts and a beta and things like that and get away with it. it's completely fine and you know women can wear you know you you want to dress smartly mm -hmm. You know, don't have too much cleavage out and show, but you know, you see women walking around in in nice dresses and nice tops, and not everyone is covered up. And yeah. you know, things are definitely changing. That's cool. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, and like, at the end of the day, like being respectful of where you are, it's not that difficult. Yeah. Whenever you go away in any any country, you go to go traveling wherever, like it's not that hard to be. Yeah, so respect the if, culture. If you can, if you can go swimming and be on the beach, and that's what you need, really. Isn't yeah, it? I think that's what I want everyone to experience. I think I when I'm in Durham, you go out there, and it's like over here we say it's like cutting glass over there it's cutting oil you know it's like <laughs> it's oil it's flat it's lovely yeah and yeah, it's um, a real nice yeah you go out area. there and like the sun's just starting to rise especially in winter as well you know when it's like you're peaking at 28 30 degrees it's like nice. imagine if like Perfect. a european club wanted to come over here and train you know now you can get a like a, a, a tourist visa yeah. you can literally do it in 10 minutes and it grants you 90 days of access and it's a six hour flight with a two hour time zone change. I was like, we would fly all the way to South Africa for a warm weather camp. Like imagine if we just flew six hours to Jeddah or Riyadh, two hour time zone change. You've yeah. got 25 degrees minimum year round. You just train on start, flat water. Start advertising your place out. If you had slightly more infrastructure, you could, yeah. you could generate some income from doing training camps. Actually. Yeah. And use that to fuel the, the further development of the system. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I think that'd be really cool you know get more people over there and experiencing the culture yeah yeah no that's that's awesome and it, it definitely sounds like a challenge that you enjoy i think as well like from hearing you talk about this and like what your plans for the future are and like also it's probably fueled by like having those committed athletes that actually want to train and they're going through all those hoops like you can't be the one letting them down you just want to like give them all the opportunities that you possibly can to, to yeah. succeed if they, if they want it that much like it, you'll bring it right yeah and that, that is that is the hardest thing you know it's just for example this this training camp having on saturday it should have happened on the 1st of august and on the 8th uh on the 28th we should be flying out to china but because of liquidity issues back home and changes of agencies we couldn't book the training camp i wasn't allowed to so now this camp's been delayed three weeks and we're finally getting it happening on saturday I've been emailing all day because the um, the Saudi weekend is Friday, Saturday, and then Monday is our Sunday. And so today's the last day to sort of get anything booked because we got the flights, but 
we haven't got accommodation yet. Yeah. So we're trying to get that sorted. And so that's like the stressful side of things. And then the hard side is just actually at some point we've got to make a selection. Yeah. And you got to sit there and you got to tell these athletes that have committed so much, you know, the back of your mind, you're like, it's only been a year, but actually in that year, you've managed to start a completely new sport. You've been juggling with a full-time job and family. You know, it, it's quite tough to then say, we're still not where we need to be because where we need to be is is competitive and you're not going to be competitive within a year yeah. of being on a sort of a part-time training program. So it's going to take a couple of years to get there. I think for me, it's just remembering it's it's part of the process. You yeah, know, it's that, that's the tough it. side of being a coach. You've got to make those tough decisions. Every coach will say, every coach has said, Ben Nurse has said it, anyone his coach has said the toughest bits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then again, I've, I've learned from my time as an athlete and when those athletes have said, oh, I don't quite agree with this. I feel a little bit upset. Can you tell me why? I'm like, sure, I have the data. Mm. You know, the data I was never given when my selection was coming around, like I, I learned as an athlete, I could accept that. And mm. I show them the data. And it's like, oh, actually, fine. Like, I, a, I accept that. Makes sense. That's the bit I loved about coaching is like, I love this sport. I don't love everything about this sport. And there's definitely a lot of things that I didn't agree with or I didn't like. But now as being in charge, I get to take this sport, push all these things that I didn't like out of it, bring the great things and like deliver that to people. Yeah. Be like, look how awesome this sport is and like the shit that like pissed me off. Like I don't have to do it because I'm in charge. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you enjoy that as well. Yeah, being I do. Charge, and and the that's reins. the thing. You, you feel like you're doing, you feel like you're doing a good job. And I think that's, that's I think that's one of the strengths of the athletes we have. Um, you know, they're all, they're all mature adults. You know, a lot of them started Rome when they're 28, 29. Some of them are older than I am. And so they have no issues telling you how they feel. And so even when you have those discussions, we have one in Walton. He's like, I don't agree with the selection you made. I was like, okay, well, this is the data to support that. He's like, okay, well, I accept that. But you weren't very clear with the dates that you said this and the dates you said that. I was like, okay, I'll make a mental yeah. note. And I, I accept that, you know, my goalposts were being changed by the higher above. So yeah. had a knock on effect to you, but... I'm still learning and I take on everything that they tell me. You know, you listen to some of it, you discard some of it. Yeah. But it's all it's all moving in that right direction. You just apply apply that mentality that made you amazing at rowing to the next thing to your job. Like how can I get a little bit better today? How can I yeah. do this a little bit better? How can I provide that a little bit better? And that for us with just yeah. as simple as fixing row machines, you know, I do so many now. It's like how how can we be a little bit faster? <laughs> how can we do that better? How can we be yeah. more efficient with the tools that we carry and like that's the, the fun bit. The systems helping each other out, yeah. like not getting in each other's way, that kind of thing. So if you were to like improve day on day, just that small marginal gains, et cetera, imagine five years down the line, where 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 do you see this project and how do you see yourself in it? Um, so I think over time, I'd probably move more into the, the sole performance director role. Mm. Um, I think we are looking for a general structure and I think the federation are looking to sort of bring on some more coaches to help the grassroots development side of things at the moment there are so few coaches that we're all wearing all the hats yeah. like one day yeah. you're a technical person the next day you're a head coach the next day you're the boatman this day you're working at a national indoor event and you're doing a charity thing and you're driving trailers and stuff like that yeah yeah but i think in i think in five years time i would like it just to be in a position where you know our athletes are making a finals and they're being competitive we have a real structure to it. I think that's what I quite liked about the British setup was that you knew like in every quarter of the year yeah. what was going to happen. Like this was this trial, that was that trial, this was seat racing selected by there. Then you got the World Cup, blah, blah, blah. At the moment, it's, it is literally up to me. I would look at the race color and be like, I think we can go to that regatta, this regatta, maybe that one. And I think we're trialing out. Like this year we went to Vienna International and it was actually a really good regatta. And I was like, oh, maybe we'll keep going to that one. And just in five years time, I want to get to a point where, you know, we've been to some regattas, they haven't really worked out logistically. They're a nightmare and they're just a waste of time. And in five years time, it's like, we have a blueprint of how we get things done. You have your calendar, and it increases yeah. the efficiency of the whole selection process, how the team is provided for. And, you know, we'll have a boathouse and we'll have some clubs in the country. At the moment, everything is funded through the Federation, but... Yeah. In five years, I want us to have university boat clubs. I want like Jabel Boat Club and, you know, self-efficient rowing clubs yeah, yeah. with their own athletes that we can start taking from. That is absolutely incredible. And I, and I love those plans for the future. I think 
I think definitely with the way you're going and like the progress that you've made in the last year, just even having this conversation, I think is is looking like probably maybe the entire nation of Saudi Arabia will catch the rain bug, or we should, uh, or we should hope so. Hopefully, <laughs> no, that's yeah. the plan. We're trying to do a lot of it, and I think it is growing. I mean, for some reason, the other day we did a marathon relay in uh, in a gym called Arena. And it's a really nice gym and they've thankfully given us permission. So now our women's squad can train in there. Typically, like interval is where the women train and arena is where the men train. Mm. But through the Olympic Commission, we've got permission. So now the women can train with the men. And we have a really good S&C coach, Dia. Um, he does all our, our, our weight stuff for us. But, you know, if the Federation athletes are there, come and join in as well. So, you know, we have a team of sort of 10 athletes, men and women and juniors yeah. doing their weight sessions together. And that's what it's all about. I mean, like, even on Saturdays, you know, it died down a little bit through Ramadan, but leading up to there, every Saturday after our water session, everyone had to bring something with them for food. Mm -hmm. And we'd have a massive table and everyone would put their food down. It's a big sharing culture and you'd have seniors, coaches like yeah. myself, the juniors are there, the under 23s there, and everyone's just sitting down having a massive breakfast, just that whole family vibe, just creating a nice little, you know, a nice little feel about it, create that culture from, from the very first day. That's awesome. I, I absolutely love that. This this has been this has been an incredible conversation. I, I feel like I've learned so much during it and it's just really, really interesting to be able to speak to someone in, in that kind of position from not just a country or a cult, different culture, but also from someone who's just on the from a place that's on the up and up and on the come up and hopefully it's going to turn into a Rome behemoth. In, yeah. in, the, in the coming years and so, no, i've really enjoyed this and i'm hoping we can at some point sit down and, and talk talk with you again about yeah. this stuff yeah in the future yeah it's uh i think it's, it's exciting i'm excited i think it's exciting for rowing in general like hearing about any new new projects like this and we're so stuck we've got our blinkers on in gb because we do well and that's what we know and that and that's our thing and i think it's it's really exciting to like learn about other things and how, yeah. how that works and the different challenges that that are involved in it and stuff but um yeah, I think we need to do our quick fire, yeah, quick yeah. fire questions before Can, we finish. Must okay. not forget. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, uh, it's the question that I always ask, which is out of all the training venues that you, or locations that you've trained at, raced or visited, what are some of your favorites and why? Uh, I like Ed Ballet. Yeah. I probably always disgrace it when I pronounce it like that. Yeah, yeah. Always in my head, it sounds like egg baguette, but it's definitely not. <laughs> egg baguette. So all the, all the French teams are going to come at me <laughs> after that. <laughs> but I, I think that's just like beautiful water. You know, yeah. you've, got, you've got a mountain on one side, you've got basically a beachfront on the other side, you know, similar to Munich as well. Crystal clear, like lovely turquoise blue water. Um, I really enjoyed rowing in Trakai in Lithuania as well. With, oh with yeah, the, with a the castle. castle in there as well. That was really cool. Um, and I think, what's the other one? Maybe even Korea, you know, oh, rowing so, in Chongju. Uh, Chung Chongju, I yeah, think, was yeah. in Korea because they had uh, like a, um, an Air Force base next to it. So every now and then you got these fighter jets flying oh. over your head and you're just like, oh, what's that? <laughs> That's it. That's so sick. Last 500. I need a push. Boom, fight. Yeah, jet. fighter jet out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that way you're up. Um, what's the other one? Uh, so one I like to ask is um, if you could travel back in time um and meet the the version of you when they first really caught the rowing bug when you first started to become obsessed with it you could travel back in time and give that kid a piece of advice for their journey what would you say to him don't go out too hard on your 2k ergo test <laughs> pace the first 500 <laughs> is that was that a career mistake well career long mistake <laughs> i think i was always one of these guys that would always get a big first 500 in the bag and then sack off the middle k because it would just hurt too much and then i'd do a huge sprint finish at the end perfect that's the perfect exactly. yeah so i think when the first time i broke six minutes it was like a i don't know it was like a, a one 128 and then i sat on 132 through the middle and then did like a 128 through the line and was like yeah i did it broke six minutes but then as i got older it was like slowly getting a little bit thinner I think by by the end of it, like my last one I did, I think I actually used to like back off in that first 500 and then sort of settle in the second 500, but then start the sprint from a thousand meters out. Okay. Oof, but I think, a long way to go. Right? Yeah, because I'm someone that builds a lot of lactate quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I had to sort of like regulate the first thousand and then I could push it on once I found my groove. I, uh, what was it? Satchel was having the diesel engine. 
Mm, yeah, yeah. I was definitely a bit of a DZ. I had to get warmed up into the race a bit, but once I was in my groove, I could just keep trucking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah. um, I was going to ask if you were to repeat or do one regatta again when you're 60 or 70, what would it be and why? Any what uh, an international any regatta race, or any race you did? Just you know, an which event. One, which one would you uh, want to relive? Or probably like Peterborough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but nice. bring, bring back the old days before they got rid of the pole. <laughs> if anyone raced back in the day, <laughs> what was that? Well, Peterborough Summer Regatta. Yeah. Uh, so I went there for the first time in 2008. I think I raced with Staines. Yeah. Uh, I did an eight and a four and a pair, and that's the first one I met Scott. But Peterborough is a two day event. Yeah. And so the first day you did the 1Ks, and you come off and you get absolutely hammered that night, and there's like naked pole climbing and uh, people okay. getting quite messy. And then the next day, you, you then go out and race again, but everyone's just like knackered. It's a bit more tame now. I think they got rid of the pole and for health and safety reasons and like launches were being sunk in the middle of the night and stuff like that. But I remember that was probably a really fun regatta when I was sort of just getting ready for uni, fresh out of juniors. <laughs> Amazing. I like that. Yeah, take it back to when it was just for the love of it. Yeah. And no other reason, yeah. Yeah, those little... Or maybe even Burway regatta. Yeah. Yeah, I never made it down the Burway course. It was a 500 metres round a bend and I hit a boat when 200 metres and capsized. So maybe I need to re-enter it just so I can finish the one. course. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think that's a good shout. That's a good one, yeah. I've got one last question. Um, out of, during your own career, who were some of the people that you've looked up to the most or some people you could call your idols, I guess? Yeah, I got asked this a question before when I did quick fire in Saudi. And I think I've never actually had like a sporting idol. I think for one thing I've always said is I've always taken inspiration from my family and my parents, just seeing how hard the closest people around me were working to give us the life that they wanted us to live. And I took a lot from that, just seeing the, you know, the long hours my mum was putting in. My dad's always been self-employed, seeing the long hour he, he put in and my yeah. grandparents and you know, even my older brother, watching him go through university and I'd always just follow him. Whatever he did, I would do the same thing. So it's more taking inspiration from the people closest to me, mm -hmm. like driving me forward. And I think, you know, talking about being dyslexic and having a stutter, for me, that was more of like a blessing through school. I had to create my own coping mechanisms to yeah. deal with that and still progress. And I think I took that into my career. Like if I'm struggling with something, let's figure out how I can make the most of it and still come out the other side better. That is that is an awesome answer. Yeah, a good we answer. Not ha We haven't had that like one like that before. No, so that one. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. Awesome. Once, once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck for the for the Asian Games. Thank you very right. much. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, man. It's uh, it's been awesome fun. I mean, it's always really fun when I get when we get to chat with someone who I've I've rode with as well and and share some stories, which has been which has been really good. And just looking over your career, like I said, from from 07 to to twenty one, hitting it, hitting senior worlds or, or Olympics every year, like you know, it's tough that 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 final step wasn't really there but like i don't think anyone can can look back at a career like that and not say that that was absolutely world class so you know hopefully that uh i think the further you get away from it the happier you can be with it but yeah thank you, you very know, much i certainly put you up with with the best with the best there ever there was um so yeah i know it's been awesome to speak to you thank and you. my best of luck with saudi and like we're we're definitely uh rooting for you and yeah and like, keep an eye out yeah keep an eye out hopefully they'll be there one day yeah yeah for sure <laughs> yeah they will be awesome so on that note Easy there. Cue the music.